Hello, welcome to the Whiskey Lodge Cast. I am your host, Demi Taste, and my co-hosts here are Duckville Platypus and Spooky Chicken. Today, we have as our special guest, Joe O'Sullivan, master distiller of all brands for Hood River Distillers, including Career Creek Distilling, which makes my personal favorite American single malt brand, McCarthy's Oregon Single Malt Whiskey. Hello, Joe, and hello, everyone. How are you this afternoon? Oh, it's a great day. I'm really happy to be here, and I'm really happy to be part of... Uh... Let me taste. I know that uh, I'm a personal member of the Whiskey Lodge. Uh, I'm I'm a proud member of the Whiskey Lodge. So being part of this event is like you know it's just hanging out with friends, good people. <laughs> so uh, uh, we I filled you in off stream. Uh, our little bit that we do is that we've got something that is not alcoholic to start our podcast with. I today have Gatorade because I had a nasty headache an hour ago and I'm trying to get hydrated. I have a bubbly bounce, okay, which is a wine, slightly is a... carbonated. Oh. Uh, the notorious audio sync issues. Go ahead, Joe. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if I'm to go first, I'll just say it. I got a bubbly bounce. It's a it's a uh, slightly caffeinated, carbonated uh, beverage that doesn't have any flavor. It's supposed to taste like blood orange and grapefruit. It tastes like. Uh, it does not taste like blood, orange, or grapefruit, but it does give me a little bit of a jolt, so I'm happy to have it. Okay, uh, go ahead, Duck. Uh, I've got Cheer Wine, which is a uh, regional uh, soft drink that is made in, I believe, North Carolina. Um, it's one of my favorites. And, uh, it's Good cherry old stuff. I, ish. I, yeah, I, I grew up drinking that myself. It's it's fun stuff. I don't know. I haven't had it in a long time, so I'll need to see if it holds up again. But I'm drinking just some uh, hibiscus syrup and lime and some sparkling water. Ah, uh, you went the complicated virgin cocktail route. <laughs> Something like that. And good evening, chat. I see Genji has joined us once again. Good to see you. Oh, Genji. Uh, so, uh, with all that prelude out of the way, um, I am going to promptly forget about my non-alcoholic drink, um, and get into my McCarthy's that I've poured in this, uh, McCarthy's glass. I believe everyone here has some McCarthy's for the evening. It'll be the first whiskey I have had in uh, about two and a half weeks now, so I'm quite happy with it. Yeah, and, uh, as our I... regular, uh, as our regular listeners and watchers will know, uh, you've been on vacation traveling for about two weeks. Yeah, being out in uh, in Spain, out up in Galicia, doing their walk in the Camino for a little while. A lot of wine, mostly wine. Not that much water going on, but a lot of wine. <laughs> I don't really quite know how they live up there, honestly. I keep hearing that about Europe. Low ABV yeah. beer, wine, not, not so much in the Ooh. way of water. <laughs> a lot of uh, this malty kind of beer called the Estrella Galicia. Uh, they're really, really good stuff, and uh, a lot of sweeter, um, what do you call them, the kind of lemon, uh, lemonade beer sort of uh, mix-up, I forget exactly, uh, Shandies, I think they're called, oh, a lot of those there. going on. Radler, that was it, thank you. Well, it is great to have mm. you here, uh, Joe, and, um, well, what are you drinking, Uh Right now, I'm gonna. I'm drinking that limited uh, McCarthy's cognac barrel uh, finish that we had. This is a, a, a collaboration we did with the Multnomah Whiskey Library, and quite honestly, it's one of my favorite ones we've been able to release. And the fact that it was like, I think one of the reasons it's so special is that this was a request. It wasn't something that me and my crew kind of developed on our own. The fact that it came out so great was like us being able to play with somebody else's money and somebody else's barrel. And we're really fond of it. I realize now that even though I've lined up all of my, uh, on this side of me, all of my McCarthy's expressions, or at least I thought I had, I did actually forget one. I have a bottle of that too, and it's in the closet across the room. So I might grab that later, but for now I'll let it be. Um, mm. So I would love to talk about uh, great coincidence. We didn't plan. At, we didn't plan for this at all. We just scheduled this interview, and it turns out that uh, yesterday, um, Clear Creek released the latest McCarthy's release. If I have that right, at least it went up on Sealbox. The six-year finished in Oloroso casks. Um, 
I would love to know the story of that whiskey as much as you as in as much detail as you would like to share, Joe. Oh, no, I'm happy to talk about it. And this has been um, a real pleasure of mine to speak to this and to release it, mostly because it's the first blend of our newest distiller at Clear Creek, McCarthy's and Hood River Distillers, Garrett Trotter. And Garrett um, uh, Garrett did a fantastic job. It, like a lot of uh, finished whiskeys, especially ones finished in sherry, uh, that 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 has a little cachet right now but one of the things that typically i think people forget is that you can alter your base spirit in the blend and the way it's designed to meet what's going to be in that cask and what garrett was able to achieve with this was doing a little bit of a brinier release of mccarthy something that had a little bit of the heat in the sand in the sun of summer pair that up with like the 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 rich oily cashew and macadamia nut quality that will come out of an oloroso and you have this like different reflection of the peat and the smoke that's been kind of our hallmark for so long i i think he did an incredible job it's also i have to thank zach crow he was he did all the design for the label uh we seem to be getting sexier as we get older that's not to- normally what happens and and not for me personally at least but but for McCarthy's as a brand, I, I think that some of our most attractive releases have been the last couple of years. And so I, I can't I can't thank enough my my crew for working with me. The barrels themselves, uh, they're coming out of the Casnolia line, which is Cooperage del Sol. Uh, a man named Rafa came by the distillery a while back. It turned out that he was the most knowledgeable barrel, barrel broker that I'd ever worked with. He had representations of each sherry that you could get. And one of the great things about working with Castnolia is you can, as a distiller, design what barrel you want. And so do you want it to be French oak? Well, you can have that. Do you want it to be American white oak? You can have that. What sort of sherry do you want in there? Tempranillo, PX, Oloroso? Um, you can get any of them. Sometimes you have to wait a few years because they're in hot demand. Tempranillo is really hard to get right now. But... Uh, this has been uh, really interesting because we can say to him, hey, we want to age this for two years in uh, we want to age. We, we want to finish this in a sherry cask that has held sherry for two years. That is number one char, new American oak, and, and they can achieve your specific order. So that's been why I've really liked working with them. It's clear that. Uh, they are willing to get you what you need down to a T. And as a distiller, that's a lot of fun to have that level of creative control. So I'm, I'm there ha- a... Oh, sorry. So I was just going to say, I'm, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to keep talking about it if you have any questions. Oh, yeah. so that I yeah, leave some uh, space. Uh, I thank you for confirming that it was Casknolia. I suspected that was the case based on the PX release. But I wasn't sure, so I didn't include that in the review that I posted last night. Um, I was wondering, yeah. uh, in addition to that, I was wondering if you could comment on how long the finishing in Oloroso was. It's typically, we have found, you know, and I can't remember the exact like date, how many like specific days because we pulled it. And someone asked me that earlier this week, and I was like, I said I'd get back to him, completely forgot to do it. Um, uh, right around four months. It, it tends to be what we think it's where it really kind of works out, where you're going to be getting the good influence of the barrel without kind of putting it on. I'm, I've been workshopping this expression a little bit um, about discussing finishes and that uh, a finishing barrel is a seasoning. It's in it's not cheese sauce because I've definitely come across a fair number of um, releases where you get some sherry in there or you get red wine or you get, uh, porter and it's it, it it tastes like that's all your that's all that's in your glass and it's a shame because it should be about the balance and it should be about trying to develop a flavor that challenges your understanding of the base brand rather than tries to cover it up with something else so on that note i did actually have a little question about that so you've done a px uh, cask finish um i believe that was last year uh, and then uh onto the oloroso sherry sherry finish was there a reason that you wanted uh, you really particularly wanted um or garrett i suppose actually really particularly wanted oloroso next 
Uh, well, uh, it was the Oloroso arrived before Garrett got the blend. And, and I and remind me to tell you, or I'll, I'll finish up with this, like how we develop, who, how we decide who gets to do the blend. Mm. Um, and I'll get to that in a moment. But it, we gave, we had kind of a wish list and there was things we could get this year versus next year. And the Oloroso, I think it was like number two or number three in the in the in the list of things we wanted to bring in uh for our finish for our secondary finish alongside px we knew we wanted more px it was very successful uh duck's got a, a bottle of it behind him i can see it there with the orange label but one of the things we wanted to try to do is complement it nicely and mm -hmm. so uh i mean complement that release i should say and so oloroso seemed kind of a good contrast to the rich fruitiness of the px this offered something that was a little bit more rich but also you know lighter in terms of tone if we could speak this in terms of color px is all jammy bruised red fruit and oloroso is all dry piney loam uh, with a little bit of that h harder, richer oil content in it that you that I relate to as being, you know, pistachio, cashew, whatever. God damn, I'm gonna need to get a bottle of that. <laughs> Available on Silbox at this very second. <laughs> Can confirm, it's quite good, uh, and it is definitely more nutty, undeniably, than any other McCarthy's I've had so far. Um, my biggest takeaway. Uh, from doing that review and comparing it to the other, uh, the six year, the six year PX, um, the cask strength stuff that I've had earlier, uh, even the Lost Lantern, is that uh, McCarthy's has um, a lot of faces in terms of how it presents depending on the blend and the barrel. Um, it can be much more bitter, um, like old library books, uh, I think is a nice note that I got from the first cask strength. Uh, Pop Rocks. An interesting texture and kind of flavor, like sort of like raspberry pop rock, something like that, was something I got there. Oh yeah, I kind of get that. I can get that too, actually. I, I think, but I'm having a. It's, I don't know if maybe that's the cognac, but I I like that. I really liked old library books. I'm gonna have to tell that to Dave from St. George. He loves a really interesting, um, a really interesting tasting note. Always. I remember the provide. first time I ever tried uh, tried McCarthy's. I got a. <laughs> very distinct uh, licorice note. And now I'm not really getting that all too much anymore. You know, this is the first one I've ever bought. So this is a very, very newly opened bottle right here. So I'm not sure how it'll open up in the future. Is that a teacup you're drinking out of today? This is, um, you know, I don't actually know what this cup is. There was a, I have a lot of weird little, weird little cups that I drink whiskey out of. Uh, this one I bought from a, a like a fireman yards, a yard sale um, for, for uh, sort of promoting or uh, supporting the local firehouse. Um, I do not know what kind of cup this is. My dad is almost certain that I'm drinking out of a candle holder. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> so I don't really know. It works well, though. It's quite nice. It's got. It does have. It does kind of look like it needs a tea light or a votive just hanging out in there. A little bit, a little bit. Just so you it's know, I, I, fire, I've, I guess. I, I've just shared uh, the the bitter like old library books tasting note with uh, with the folks at St. George. I'm I'm I will live I will live report their their response to that if it comes in tonight. Okay, great. Um, I guess on the, on other notes, um. Uh... The Lost Lantern McCarthy's tend to come across a little bit more sweeter and caramelly, which is, um, I feel like that's more of a, that's like a crowd pleaser kind of profile. And it's great that McCarthy's can do that. Um, it is great to know that there's that versatility there. Not my, not like the personal uniqueness that attracts me to McCarthy's, but it is quite excellent. Uh, all the same. Um, yeah. And I can't. I, I was if I could just quick, quickly chime in and advocate for Lost Lantern uh, as a distiller. I've worked with a lot of, uh, you know, kind of custom jobs, single barrels, etc. Uh, Lost Lantern is a whole new level of influence over what winds up going in the bottle. Uh, there's 
they, everybody makes it their own and everybody every single barrel i've ever sold is a discussion but there is something about the timeliness that the that lost lantern took as well as just the joy that adam and nora um, have put into their company it, it's amazing and nora is such an incredible authority on not just whiskey but business that it makes the actual function of being a distiller and doing this uh, just a breeze. We have a large amount of love for Lost Lantern here in this podcast. Um, oh, yeah. So we're just doubling down on that today. Uh, they really do great. Oh, stuff. yeah. Um, one of my favorite facts about them is that uh, they have different profiles preferences. And everything that they release is something that they both like, which virtually guarantees mm. that it's going to be a crowd pleaser. And that is a real good way to run a whiskey business, in my opinion. Yeah, we've had some great experiences with them at Del Bach. Last time they were in was a little bit before I started working there. Uh, by the way, thanks for getting me my job, Joe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think you got yourself <laughs> that job, man. I don't know if I had anything to do with uh, it. I don't know. The first, the, uh, Mark was out sick. The first time that uh, that I was ever in um, that I was ever in that I ever saw him in the that I was uh, that I actually got into the distillery and then when he finally came in I walked into the uh, to the back of the distilling room and Mark looked at me and he was like oh you're that guy that Joe emailed me about yeah 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 nice to meet you <laughs> I, I I I may have emailed him about about you I I just I said listen there's this guy I don't know very well but he has a passion for this that has to be commented upon and and i hope you give him a second look but um just for the record you you got yourself that job i i had oh, nothing to you. do with it no oh, thank you yeah, yeah yeah i mean ever since i started working there i haven't seen steven give uh have to have to give it to steven is the uh the mm -hmm. uh the founder of the company oh he's a busy busy man uh he's getting up yeah. into his high 70s now and i have not you can't keep him out of the damn office <laughs> but uh so, yeah so I, I i have to say this because this is a rare opportunity and doug i i forgive you i i i please forgive me for like kind of railroading this moment um so garrett trotter the man who designed the the oloroso finish uh he just you have no idea how um the reverence he has for Whiskey Del Bach. And we just had his baby shower last weekend. He the 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 very first, you know, you get a one or two in your cups and you think, I'm gonna break out my special barrels, my special bottles, the things that mean the most to me. You would as one would assume that Garrett Garrett would immediately go and grab the Oloroso and say, This is my first release. No, you know what he did? He brought out your whiskey. He brought out Whiskey <laughs> Del Bach. <laughs> And it was phenomenal. Everyone loved it. It's incredible. I, I it, there's a little bit of 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 Mark and Steve and you in in the Southwest and in in this design for sure. And I can taste it. Oh, that well, that's that that means a lot. To, I'll I'll make sure that to uh, to let them know that as well because that that'll mean quite a lot to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, they're great people. I mean, we're influenced by everybody we come across in this industry. Mm -hmm. That they, they, you know, we just want to do them proud. I am not bothered at all by that railroading. I, I love hearing industry <laughs> inside baseball, how people got their jobs, what distillers do in their free time. Uh, speaking of which, uh, before we went live, Joe was serenading us with his newest guitar. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I actually, I actually also had a question stop. about that. I, I won't put you on the spot and ask you to, to serenade us again live, but if you are so inclined. Can you play whiskey again? No, I'm not playing that again. <laughs> no way. I, <laughs> no, no, no. That was that's that's like the equivalent of songs that I sing to and about my cats. Oh yeah. The, the um for for all the the uh, listeners and things like that, Joe serenaded us with a, with a wonderful song earlier called "Whiskey." I'm afraid it's it's exclusive. Uh, but I, I yeah. did actually want to ask um before we get into the to the nitty gritty things, uh, Demi has a lot of wonderful questions for you. But um uh growing up, I'm sure we all grew up with certain uh, folk songs, certain songs that really enjoyed probably about drinking because there are a lot of them out there. Are there any particular songs about whiskey, about drinking, and things like that that you particularly enjoy that you go back to joe oh geez i mean is the entire play uh set list is the entire like track list for rum sodomy and the lash okay because like the pogues <laughs> was one of the best the best drinking albums of my entire like teens and 20s i i 
Yeah, I mean, that's the first thing I think about. Like, I could just go back to that Metallica cover, but who hasn't heard that enough? Mm, fair enough. Yep, Rum Sodomy and the Lash, every every song on it uh, is incredible. Uh, really fantastic stuff out there. Oh, I'll have to go give that a listen to again after we get off this podcast, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Duck, Demi, any, any songs that you would like to share with the audience or with everyone like that? I can't say that I have much to add to that particular question, the way you phrased it. Um, I don't, I don't know that I really grew up with drinking songs. Oh, fair enough, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are a lot in, uh, in sort of the Irish folk music and, and bluegrass that are about drinking, moonshining, and sort of that ethos. Um, one that. I enjoy listening to just because it's uh, a really fun, upbeat song is uh, the Irish Rovers uh, rendition of Finnegan's Wake Mm -hmm. because it's just a lot of fun. Uh, Duck, since we're talking about kind of um, Appalachia and and all that area, uh, what about Roscoe Holcomb and Moonshiner? I mean, one of the best uh, banjo players out there. I mean... Most of the bluegrass that I listened to was uh, back when uh, 88.5, the the WAMU, the um, uh, local NPR station, used to to do bluegrass all day on Saturday into hot jazz Saturday Mm -hmm. night. And so most of the bluegrass that I listened to was that, and they tended to stay away from the more explicitly about moonshining uh bluegrass musics that's amazing i really gotta 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 go listen to some of stuff some of the stuff that y'all are talking about because i don't listen to all that much bluegrass but uh, i hate to cut this one short a little bit but i do want to get to a little question that someone in our audience has just asked us yeah there's some good Uh, questions in the audience uh so first of all i just want to clarify when you say um the pawn when you say unable to purchase was that uh is sealbox sold out i i have no idea okay uh sailor graph can add the oloroso to his cart so it looks like it is not yet sold out could be a mm. location problem uh based on where they uh where they actually ship to um mm. I know that that's something that we like to hassle you about in the Whiskey Lodge sometimes, Joe. When we have a new <laughs> member that we they're like, "What's a what's a good uh, what's a good smoky whiskey to try, or what's a good American single malt whiskey to try?" We invariably will mention McCarthy's, um, and then they say, "I can't find that in my local store," and we say, "We know a guy who can hook you up, maybe," and then we send them your way. <laughs> Um, I'm really happy and really proud of the folks at Hood River Distillers. McCarthy's has always had a supply issue. We tend to sell out really quick and we tend to not make, um, uh, we tend to not make enough to meet demand. It's, it's not really intentional. It's just kind of, we're busy and we really focus on a lot of brandy. Um, and, uh, you know, I think with when Steve McCarthy was running Clear Creek and still associated with it, and that's the man who started Clear Creek, he was my mentor. Well, I, I think he enjoyed keeping the whiskey with his name a little bit coveted and protected. Uh, I have to have the, I, I get to have the, the really happy opposite experience, which is that, like, I want to promote this man for what he's done for me. And so... I get to build McCarthy's and make it as big as I can get it, which I know he would um, tell me to my face he hates, but I guarantee you he would have loved it more than anything in the world. Uh, Steve meant the world to me, and I would never do anything that he didn't secretly want in his heart because I knew him. You know, I hope I knew him well enough. Uh, He was a good guy. So it being on Sealbox now... Big success for for Hood River Distillers. I really appreciate uh, them making this work. And thank you, Sealbox. And thank you, Blake, for having us there. We have long coveted a spot on that website. It It's kind of like, it feels a little bit like you make it, like you've made it when you get on there. And that's a big deal to me. Yeah, now that you mention it, I realize this is the first time that McCarthy's has been up on Sealbox. And by the way, we should also mention that the PX is listed. Uh, the six-year PX finished McCarthy's is also listed on Sealbox now. Um, 
But I didn't Wait, realize really? that right away <laughs> because the Lost Lantern McCarthy's were available on Sealbox. Um, and so that was one way that some people who otherwise could not get McCarthy's could get some McCarthy's. I um, need to go order that PX Sherry cask after. <laughs> yes, uh, clicky, clicky clicky right now. Uh, yeah, I, clicky, I don't know clicky. how many there are. It could be, yeah, keep the PX a secret. Uh, it's a good thing we're not streaming that live to the whole internet right now. Damn, well, it would be terrible. For <laughs> Speaking of, uh, <laughs> questions from the internet, by the way, before we move on too far from this conversation. Jordango over in the, I'm just going to read these comments uh, verbatim, um, but Jordango asked two questions. First of all, uh, for the um, McCarthy Casco Oloroso finish, what's planned for that Oloroso barrel right now? Oh, that's a great question. Um we're open to any suggestions. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do with it just yet. <laughs> I, I don't know if I really thought about that yet. Uh, you know, I'm more of a moment-to-moment, a, a, a panic decision individual. So uh, I don't know. I, I Maybe let me think about that and get back to you, Jordango. I know where to find you. You've what got, a you've wild got a rush thing to, do to nothing. say. Yeah. You've got to rush to do nothing the... so that you can make a snap decision and then wait on it for months, years. <laughs> years. Yeah, I, I mean the reality is that I probably it could just be a long age here. I don't know. We're gonna we're doing that with some of the PX. We haven't actually done it yet, but some of the older PX barrels that we've retired because they're not really doing a finishing job. We're thinking of making like uh, not finishes, but agers and so we're thinking of just seeing what happens putting mccarthy's in there for a decade or so <laughs> and and hopefully it'll be a good thing yeah so second question from jordango is also about that oloroso finish i'm just going to read this out verbatim because they, this is a somewhat longer one uh jordango says you mentioned that garrett was going for i think you said like a sand and ocean breeze flavor in the blend was that targeted during distillation or did there just happen to be enough variety in the available stocks to pull that kind of flavor profile together oh great question and this is a really really good question and something and i and one i had um i is talking about the specific thing earlier today with um uh my friend steve who's from the american single malt commission and honestly same question um we can target it target it in the distillation and yes that is possible it's also kind of the dream that hasn't happened for us yet mm. i would love to get to the point where i can say in six years i'm going to release barrels xyz specifically to this and we're going to do that by doing like uh you know I don't know, operating with these uh, these chambers open, these bubble caps open, the deflamator lower, and try to sculpt it the way we want. But we are not there. Um, and maybe that's an okay thing. I, actually, it's definitely an okay thing, because there's other weird, interesting ways of doing it. The contribution of the barrel is well understated. And when I don't mean, when I say the barrel, I don't mean like the idea of oregon oak and what it does to mccarthy's or what you know american white oak does to a lot of urbans but the specific individual barrel itself where the trees that comprise those staves grew and that's like this great mysterious variable that makes what we do exciting because it's the one thing we really have zero control of is the reflection of the of of the mountainside that that wood came from so variety isn't just found in the spirit and how we distill it but variety will always be this element of chaos that's introduced by the oak itself and so to answer to make a long story short yes there is enough expressions between barrels that you can sculpt something unusual and different and contrary to what the standard release has been but it takes a deeper look and it takes the ability to let go and allow that to happen and when garrett made this blend we ha I have kind of like a um it's, it's it's some people say it's like very democratic and i kind of say it's um you know it kind of a it, it's it's a weird version of uh, uh, aloof management where uh 
when we're going to do a blend, it's always for, an important blend, I mean. We're always doing it together. It's the only thing that's happening that morning. We do it in the barrel room. It happens, you do not eat food. I will buy breakfast afterwards, but you do not eat food before you show up. You are allowed black coffee and black coffee only. And uh, we kind of get a representative idea of what barrels are ripe. And maybe it's it's the majority of them. It might not be all of them. If we know that barrel 186 and 187 are like super kind of twins and they taste very similar, yeah, we'll just take 186. And if there's an issue, we can we'll sort that those two numbers out later. Um, so we take a representative batch and and we sit at a table and my head distiller Caitlin, who's uh, uh, amazing in every fashion, uh, she puts on the music of her choice. It's Often enough, the Skyrim soundtrack, which is really good yeah. design music for McCarthy's. So she puts that on, and we just sit there at a table, and everyone is allowed to kind of blend in their own style. Everyone's allowed to blend to their own taste, and we do not talk. And it probably takes about an hour of just kind of, you know, excuse the expression, uh, effing around with, with glassware, science glass, whatever you need. Uh, and we all have different styles. Uh, I tend to be a little bit more measured where I, I understand how much we need to fill and I'll try to get a representative batch off of that barrel, blah, blah, blah. But Caitlin and I, both being trained by Steve, have developed elements of a house palette that has set the tone for the current profile of your standard McCarthy's release. This is an expression of kind of where the distillery is at the moment, her and I included. Garrett, this wild card young buck, shows up, and he's being invited to his first. No, actually, it was his second. I I um I canned his first one. The uh, the um uh it was his second blend, and you could see he was hungry. And one thing that is particularly inspiring about this young man is that he doesn't have the need to follow in the terms of expressing what his creative vision is. Uh, Garrett is, um, he looks deep into what he sees and he finds his own meaning and that is cool as hell. So he designs this thing and the first thing I taste is this is nothing like Caitlin and I would, would do. This is so much different. And that to me is exciting. So with a second round and a second tweak, we got this Oloroso release which I, I really do believe carries some of those lighter, hotter summer and, you know, the days where the sun sets at 8, 30, 9, 10, and you get those long, light shadows that drift big distances down roads. Where a, a lot of McCarthy's is often in the woods, this is somehow on the street outside your house, but at sunset in the warmth. And this, that's kind of cool that he was able to, to set a different environment around this flavor profile, uh, which is one of the reasons I've been so hard in championing it. It's like, holy hell, I learned a thing about my own product. And it was Garrett that did the design. So to any young distillers out there, just seriously, just follow what you think is good. Um, it's good. It might, it might get shot down, but it's, I guarantee it's good. Uh, there's some good questions coming in on chat and uh, oh, yeah. they're actually going to dovetail with some questions I had prepared. Um, I almost want to go, I, I almost want to follow the history of this release back in time a little bit um, in terms of uh, the liquid and where the distillery has been and who's been involved. Yeah. Uh, because uh, just I mean, since I've met you three years ago, Joe, things have changed significantly. And, and even before that, things have changed significantly at Clear Creek. Um, so uh, first of all, um, I did notice that uh, the the wash in the Oloroso finish PX is Widmer Brothers, which comes as no surprise mm -hmm. because if I understand correctly, the switch to Double Mountain uh, happened with your move to Clear Creek, Hood River, sorry, with your move to Hood River, which was is less than six years ago. Uh, so wait a minute, did it did it say that online? I, I I'd have to correct it. It's it is in fact a double mountain release with this one. Oh, I I may have just gotten those flipped in my head. Um, 
It, it, I it, may, no, I may have also told you the wrong thing. Who the heck knows? <laughs> if I may ask, actually, um, this is a question. So this is the first bottle of McCarthy's that I've ever personally bought. I've only ever had it at bars before. Um, but uh, so this Widmer Brothers Brewing Company versus the um, the other one that you were saying like that. Can you give me a little bit of the history on that, of the, of the difference in that going on right there? Yeah, so so Double Mountain in Widmere, McCarthy's McCarthy's has a, a, a an interesting history. Uh, it started in, there, sorry, I got to go back to just basically the beginning of American craft distilling. It started with a guy named Hubert Robin, uh from, from uh, um, Jermaine Robin, Hubert Robin, uh, and then went to St. George, and then York at St. George taught steve mccarthy steve mccarthy hired yord to teach steve how to distill and then steve started the third craft distillery in the united states and so this there's a very tight heritage amongst the people who founded this we are all kind of brothers in this like foundational level because when i mean this predates internet and when you're a new industry that's want us to do a thing there's not a lot of resources on how to find it so it's it, you know, whatever the next big change in how we do things in the U.S., the first four or five people are going to know each other and be helping each other out. So, anyway, Steve starts Clear Creek. Everywhere you look is low and amazing hanging fruit in, on the innovation tree. And, you know, St. George releases and, and Jermaine Robin releases release incredible fruit brandies. And Steve is also doing that. I mean, like, he's bringing in Mirabelle and he's bringing in Slivovitz. And, and, and they're all, like, battling to have the most interesting pair. And this little bit of rivalry is driving them forward. But they're still firsts that naturally occur. And Steve, on a trip to Ireland, decided that he wanted to make something that was like Isla single malt. And he wanted to do it using Oregon peat. Well, when he came back, he quickly found out that there wasn't a malting house in the United States that was willing to take peat and, you know, do anything with it. Because this was an era that was entirely about basically two row barley and that was all you were going to get and i so he wound up purchasing barley from scotland which is how mccarthy's came about and became the world it became america's first single malt we were the first to distill it some people have found criticism with that by saying well you know it's it's very directly in you know a reference to things uh, in scotland and and i gotta say there's an element of truth to that so I find it not really important that we're the first, but if I'm in some ways, I mean, I'm always going to say we're the first because we are like we were the ones that did it before anyone else. But we are also the bridge. And that's a very important quality of McCarthy's, too, that we were the first uh, uh, to bridge the gap between the European traditions and now, because the one thing that Steve did different and extremely important, was he used Oregon oak barrels. Quercus Gariano was not used for spirits at the time, and everything that's happened since then, as well as using these different approaches to something other than American white oak, came from that decision. So, uh, that's cool. Like, that's really cool. We have our foot in both places. Following up that, I believe it's St. George, no surprise, your glance, Dave, Always have done cool stuff. Always leading the way. And there's always there's just been this sense of support amongst all of us in the American Sigma Mall Commission since. First has never mattered. I argued to not have it on the label because it mattered that little to me. I think I was wrong and the marketing team was right, just for the record. But the, <laughs> the truth is... I, we also were just a brandy house. And we didn't have when we were doing this, the ability to make our own wash. So we never thought this was going to be a big deal. We never thought we were inventing anything. We never thought we were the first of anything. And so the idea of having our own brew house was not that important. And we wound up partnering up with Windmere and then later on Double Mountain because while still scrambling to support this thing, 
that carried Steve's name, especially for me. I mean, this is like hugely personal to me. Uh, we are not breaking with that tradition of partnering up with somebody in the neighborhood, making this more about community, making sure that this is a reflection of not just our skill, but our association with the community around us. If we can't harvest pear, like the pear, Clear Creek rules, right? Everything comes within 200 miles of the distillery. Well, the wash does too. You know, the barley doesn't, but the wash does. We're still supporting local business. We're still supporting local something. And that's why we're really comfortable with it and uh yeah so sometimes it's windmere for the older expressions we moved to hood river now it's double mountain and the interesting thing this is my favorite fact of all which is i went to double mountain i was talking to uh, matt and uh, greg and jen and i looked around their their brewery and we were talking and they were kind of showing stuff out and I think it was Matt goes, hey, you know that this mill, the mill that we use for McCarthy's, we bought that from Windermere Brothers like a couple of years ago. So the mill that has that made McCarthy's on day one in one dis in one brewery is the mill that makes McCarthy's now in a different brewery. And if we ever move breweries again, that's very cool. I'm buying that goddamn mill. That's one of the nice. coolest things I've ever heard. That's amazing. That is really cool. Uh, so I it's just want to say, I, I did go look up the label to make sure that it's, it's, of course, the label is correct and my information was wrong. I think I know what happened uh, in my brain. Um, so anyway, yes, the, the back label of the PX, uh, sorry, of the of the six Oloroso release is uh, Double Mountain. Um, so I guess... So uh, is your... Oops, I, so I think what happened is on, on Monday, I went to the store and I happened to find the last bottle of my favorite single barrel, my first favorite single barrel, I should say, barrel 70, um, happened to still be sitting on the shelf, dusty in the back. I got the last one and I looked on the back label and I was like, ooh, Woodmer Brothers. And then because I was doing the research for this, I think it just the wires got crossed in my head. Um, so there you go. Uh, anyway, yes, uh, Double Mountain is, is the source of this one. Um, I'm glad that I, I turned that that, that question into like the longest damn answer of all time. I'm so that sorry great because I, <laughs> I did got, want to I talk about so... the source of your wash. So it's excellent. Yeah. You went the way I wanted it to go. <laughs> <laughs> I got so wrapped up in that answer. You forgot where we started. <laughs> I think, I think uh, your, your video um, and audio may have frozen there, Ian. Oh, me? Yeah, no, oh, I noticed back. that. Okay. Uh, okay, got it. Yep. Okay, sweet, sweet, sweet. I'm sorry, no. I got so um, I got so wrapped up in that answer that I did not realize, remember that I'd asked a question until the very end of that uh, of that answer. So, yeah. Um, I did want to ask, is your, is your um, basic McCarthy's uh, Oregon single malt whiskey, is that currently um, uh, Whitmer Brothers or, uh, or Double Oak, was it? Double mountain. Double mountain. Um, Double mountain. Yeah, I'm. I mean, it's it's hard. I, I typically forget this answer until I have to mm. look up what barrels we're pulling. You know, I'm pretty sure that everything that is being released of the three and the six at this point is gonna be. Yeah, I'm almost positive that it's gonna be Double Mountain. Uh -huh. um, I mean. I'm going to be totally Weirdly honest with enough, you. enough, I bought a Widmer Brothers today, so I was just actually kind of curious about that. But I don't what's, know if this one sells that much around here. What's the batch code on the bottom? Uh, W1801. I, I actually kind of thought that. I, I Ooh, almost said I something. Have. There's there, there's like a little difference to that label, and that's like, and, and I always can call it out because that's like one of my favorite batches out there. It, it really oh, is. Really? like. Yeah, no, that's a very. I'm particularly fond of that batch. It's it's like super. Um, uh, it's super capable, and I think it's the best, like all around representative batch that we've had. Honestly, maybe until the of the three year. I mean to say, uh, up until now, because the 202301 that's getting bottled currently is kind of. It, it 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 it's really fucking good. Like I, I I have such a deep affection for it, and um that one was blended by Caitlin, um and so you can as you can tell as a master distiller you get further and further away from the work. Um you do other things, but I will say this: uh, Caitlin used a little bit more of the things that I like to do in 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 blending, and um 
and I, I think I think she did an incredibly good job with this one. So when she's on this show, I want you to grill her about the twenty twenty three oh one because it's it's a really good batch. Yeah, I have a sample of that bottle here, so uh, I have the opportunity to pour the same thing that you're drinking. If I'm not mistaken, I think that means all of us have uh, the eighteen dash oh one. So that's a that's a nice place for us to connect uh, with that's zero a very coordination, fun one, yeah. especially considering <laughs> that that is the batch from five years ago and it's still kicking around. Uh, <laughs> it's it's just I don't know. I think maybe it was a little bit of I'm bigger release. I, I can't bottle. recall. It was it, I remember that one. I mean, it was oh, you know what kind of happened with that one? To be honest with you, I think a lot of it had to do with COVID, like just liquor store sales just you know some of the stuff just really crawled down so if you want to try to find older older bottles of mccarthy's like now's the time because you can find them in weird spots where people didn't really know if they wanted to spend money on a premium whiskey what a what a fascinating little little coincidence we we got we got going on here yeah and uh i believe my sample actually is from sailor graph who is in the chat today so Thank you for that. Um, so uh, there was a there was a couple more questions that went by, and, and before we get too far from the from the thing that prompted this comment, um, you were talking about blending in the barrel room and the black coffee and all that, and we had a comment come in twenty twenty four Twitch blends whiskey. Ah <laughs> <laughs> uh, shit! Yeah, why not? Like, uh, I mean, yeah, we can figure out something to do with that. Um, I don't know. I had to bug me about it. Let's see if we can get a Twitch camera in there while you watch us blend. It's it's gonna be like looking at three idiots like pour stuff in glasses and then laugh and there's Skyrim music. Like it's not gonna be cool. And you can have a peanut gallery of people who have some samples to give you feedback on about. What <laughs> well, now I have to actually talk about that with my supervisors. But at the very least, maybe we can just have a camera on. People can see stuff and we can make fun of you and you can make fun of us. Sounds like a fun time. So, by the way, are you saying that uh, the ideal time to drink McCarthy's whiskey is potentially while playing Skyrim? Oh, no. There's like... No. Yeah, of course. Like, seriously. <laughs> Wait, was that, a, was that a yeah, no, or a no, yeah? <laughs> that was... That was, that was a, like... That, that was a double yeah, just with a more confused way of saying it. Skyrim... Uh, great time to play it. I think anyone who knows me well enough knows that I'm a from software fanatic. So if you want to get me into Elden Ring, uh, you can find me. I, I, I think yeah, I'm a straight up like Uga Booga style player. So look for the naked guy with the stick, and that's me. Uh, and I guess to correct an earlier comment, I thought that this uh, that this sample was from Sailor Graph, but I might be confusing um, Morosith's handwriting. So that's entirely possible. <laughs> Anybody who's up in the Pacific Northwest, we have a tendency to meet up and give samples to each other. So uh, sometimes things get mixed up, especially when people don't label, don't put their own name on, where, on who the sample's coming from and sort of lose track. Don't need armor if you're not going to get At hit. At least uh, when I hand Exactly. Off Dodge. <laughs> oh, so what, are, what, are, what were you saying right there? I was, I was just saying. At least when I hand off a sample, it's uh, very obviously and distinctly mine. I've got a, a a seal with a duck on it. Oh, you do, <laughs> yeah. It's a wax seal, yep. Oh, that's cool as hell, man. He goes high production value on on giving samples to people. I'm kind of like I, I've someday. switched entirely over to free handing. Uh, this tiny little lip, right? I've got the. Um, let's see. Just to be extra ridiculous, and the handle of wild turkey in this tiny bottle, and just go <laughs> freehand right into the top. Usually, it doesn't My spill anything. My lord, Demi. Uh, sometimes, uh, if uh, if the whiskey is expensive enough, I'm not going to take a chance there. But you know, I don't mind <laughs> spilling a couple drops to avoid finding a funnel and then washing it later. Not a big deal. You don't have like a you don't like a flask funnel or something like that. I have a lot of them, and unfortunately, they're all dirty right now. <laughs> <laughs> we had a we had a bit of a dishwasher mishap and i haven't been able to soak them properly in vodka or something i just bought everclear that was that oh. was one of the reasons that i was in total wine is just like i want to i want to buy 
sanitation equipment to to you know um, whatever uh because we're doing some brewing and oh you're doing some brewing are you that sounds that sounds like a fun time oh uh, yeah brewing uh, at home scares me <laughs> we're trying uh it's our first uh it's our first big Andy. batch um <laughs> We've got a, there, there's a style of rice wine that uh, comes from my wife's hometown uh, that we're trying to make because you basically can't buy it in liquid form. You can buy like the, essentially the miso paste that's left over, um, but you can't actually get the wine, which is good for cooking. So we're making our own. That's kind of the tradition. Um, and we decided to do a huge batch because um, we had the brilliant idea to buy a five pound carboy, a five gallon carboy um, and an airlock and all that. So like fill it up. <laughs> it's going to be massive already massive put some pictures of that on uh twitter and i think instagram if anyone's interested in checking that out uh we have some people in chat saying cheers to the lodgers cheers back to you thank you for joining cheers yeah yeah, yeah. Cheers. No, we're very happy to see um a lot of you here yeah yeah Sláinte. i mean i i think i said years ago um for people uh who don't who, who might not be members of the lodge uh a couple of years ago, it was it like, yeah, three years ago, you said like, yeah, that's great. It's 2023. So three years ago, um, my I was at work and my Achilles tendon ruptured entirely. Like it ran up, it, it, it broke in the way that like I could hear it in my own body. Um, you always oh, have the most straight. fascinating beginnings to stories, <laughs> Joe. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to make sure um, you're listening. <laughs> uh uh, I have a crazy scar. I, I, I look a little Frankenstein uh, on my left leg. Um, yeah, so I couldn't walk for like four months. And I, I had a group of friends that that are pretty heavy into gaming. I'm sure it's pretty clear that like I kind of have a little thing for gaming myself. And um, uh, they were on Discord. And just instead of just you know complaining that alan wake 2 wasn't out yet and yes we know anyone just it's coming out in october i'm really excited i just played uh, control it's, again it's fine oh dude condor is coming out like the following year oh, i'm so excited God. for that um <laughs> anyway <laughs> instead of just complaining about these things uh i i decided i was like oh what happens if i type in like whiskey and discord and uh i found whiskey lodge and it was really funny to say like look at the search bar and kind of stumble around i think the first thing i did is like i showed a photo of my cat and um uh in my collection and immediately decided realized that um uh, for at that point i'm like you know maybe 16 years into the industry and 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 I, I realized the entire time like the people that understood whiskey the way i did were were on uh, were online <laughs> and I hadn't yeah. found you yet. And so it was, it was a really natural thing for me as I was recovering from that horrible industry or uh, injury to, to hang out at whiskey lodge. And, and it's, it's been a lot of fun. So it's a good group of people. Um, yeah, a, a lot of, a lot of good times. Uh, and I will say, uh, because, uh, I also circulated so this, this link up. in other places, uh, to this interview today. Uh, the Whiskey Lodge is where we all met. Uh, there are other whiskey discords, and I think that there is room enough in the world for everyone. Um, Good. It's just this is this is going to be my soapbox on this. I, I don't really like the tribalism that seems to happen on the Internet sometimes, and I don't want this to become one of those things. Uh, the Whiskey Lodge is a great like is a great place uh, for casual discussion of anything but whiskey with occasional whiskey chatter. Uh, that pretty much is what we do there. Um and uh, it's really newbie friendly. So uh, people who've come in and they're like, I'm interested in trying whiskey for the first time. What should I try? That's the kind of stuff that we field. And there are definitely more expert places on the Internet. Um, for example, AFISH. Um, I'm not sure if anybody yeah. from the AFISH Discord is here today. Um, but uh, oh, Jordango is that, that he or Jordango is definitely AFISH. My uh, my experience of the whole thing is that I bounced around a lot of a lot of discords um, just on, at that point, it was during COVID. I was I was not I, I'm still not very old, I suppose, but I was not very old then either, and just didn't really have the money to kind of talk about what a lot of these people were were talking about in the Discord, and sort of ended up at at um at the Whiskey Lodge, uh, and then there it offers a very wide range of people, sort of uh, who who just drink a lot of uh, Wild Turkey 101. 
um, as their sort of first whiskey and things like that, and just sort of like really enjoy talking about a lot of really cool people there. Um, and then uh, and then a lot of the people who who we talk to a lot um, uh, who just know way more than than I do and <laughs> things like that. A lot of these really cool cool people just kind of hanging around, tooling around. And I just kind of stopped there. Um, and there, but yeah, there are a lot of really cool um, whiskey communities. Um, just that hang around on the internet, alcohol communities and whiskey communities and things like that. And it makes it a lot more accessible, I think, than it would be uh, f- um, before I had done that. But before I continue on, I think Duck Phil also had something to say right here. So I'll pass it off to him right now. Yeah, and then Duck, I'd love to say something uh, to wrap this oh. up because like, I'm glad we all agree on this. So one of the one of the things that is kind of funny is i don't actually remember when i joined the whiskey lodge um i i vaguely recall that there were probably 20 or 30 members at the time and uh i was sort of looking for a place where i could you know talk to people about whiskey and sort of share my love of the smaller uh brands and also sort of uh, a more like broad understanding of what whiskey is rather than the very uh intricate nuanced uh tasting notes and i do enjoy writing and, and reading reviews and and tasting notes but sometimes it, it's really easy to get lost in the weeds um and and i kind of like the idea of being able to sort of boil notes down and and talk to people with totally different understandings of you know how things taste and and hear what other people think of things that are sort of ubiquitous i totally agree and um March i'm gonna make I'm, I'm gonna make two quick points one um everything i said about uh, uh whiskey lodge is also true about a fish i found them on the same day i didn't know what the <laughs> etiquette is around cross cross kind of promoting but like uh yeah man i have made wonderful friends on both of these places and i really really feel like i found my tribe two one of the best things that i know about whiskey lodge is that we have a couple we have like members that don't drink but have made yeah. the decision not to drink while being a members and they haven't left and we haven't made them felt feel weird like it's the most honest tribute to the fact that this is a community that just kind of like looks after each other and that's cool so um anyone on any of these channels like who thinks that maybe like i they have to drink to be our friends like you you don't gotta we're happy to just be with you we're your friends we're it's one of those things that I that I did really fall in love with about Whiskey Lodge. And we have the, the founder of Whiskey Lodge over in the chat right now, which I did not realize was you, actually, which is kind of fun. Um, but uh, but um, it, it's one of the things that really made me fall in love with Whiskey Lodge, uh, the dry weeks that we do, the the support that everyone in it sort of has for, for people who have stopped drinking, don't drink, or, uh, or don't drink as, as much as some might um it was was really something that i really enjoyed the the ability to kind of joke about drinking joke about things and like that but also take a very um sort of supportive stance on the whole thing was really really nice uh for me um uh, by the way i drink drink responsibly and uh and take take dry weeks when you can it, it really does help quite a lot uh, yeah i love enjoyment and in the general sort of experience I, I really like the um, the scheduled dry weeks that the that like we take as a group. I think that's really freaking fun, and it's r- hysterical to see kind of how the conversation changes because it doesn't change very much at all. Like there, it's like there's still kind of a <laughs> we just don't talk about whiskey, but it's like you're still mostly talking about like you know dumb movies and making fun of each other. It's great. <laughs> yeah. I have to say uh, right back at you, it is very fun to have industry people joining in on the dry weeks because, you know, drinking is literally a part of your job sometimes, um, even if 
you use a spit bucket, right? You still got to put it in your face uh, to taste it, to do your blends and everything. And, and uh, having to organize your work schedule around doing what is essentially a social, but also a health thing um, and doing it with us instead of on whatever schedule is convenient for you. That is, that is very flattering. And it's, it's really cool to have, like, I feel like that we've occasionally had some people that really do need uh, some assistance, right? Not like a full on problem, but people who uh, feel like they're not sure if they can take a break. And we just encourage them to come along with us on that. Um, and it, yeah. it helps to yeah, have I, people who literally are giving up their day job for a week, in a sense, to give them that support. So that's great. Yeah, I've been a part of a couple of those where, where, where we're all rallying around one individual that just says, hey, I want to try stopping. And it's, it's genuinely kind of fun. It's cool. I, I, I'm really proud of that community. Uh, I'd love to steer us a little bit back closer to being on topic for the interview, if I could. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, because you, you think this is good to sort of yeah. shilling our own in the internet community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah this, this great content that we're providing right now. Fantastic. Yeah, I love the casual conversations. <laughs> I do. I do still have questions, though, and I feel like I, I would be remiss not to get to them. Uh, chat also still does have some good questions. Um, first of all, I just want to say uh, for some of you. I am aware of your Twitch screen names as well as your uh, as well as your Whiskey Lodge nicknames and your Discord handles, which are in some cases all three different things. Um, it took me a minute to recognize that Echo Fall was the founder of the Whiskey Lodge because on the Whiskey Lodge he's just Joe. Um, and uh, oh! actually, for, for a while it was funny because uh, uh, Joe O'Sullivan, our guest here on on Discord, is Joe DeVee, which is a wonderful name uh oh, yeah. absolutely love um and is a great segue into the other stuff that your distillery does but we'll come back to that later let's put a pin in that um so for a while um since we had founder joe and we had other joe uh joe sullivan had his nickname set to other joe which was funny and at some point i was like why did you change your name from joe to v joe to v is just a fantastic name you should keep that <laughs> I think I immediately changed it back with your, I was like, Oh, maybe it's too silly. Uh, but the funny thing is I, uh, I was on a, I was on a tasting panel. It was me and Nicole Austin and Jared. Um, uh, gosh, what's his last name from Balconies? Uh, Demi, help me out here. Sorry. Uh, what Instead? was the question I was reading chat? I, I have a bad what, habit. What's doing. Jared, what's Jared from Balconies last name? I, Hemstead. Hemstead. Thank, thank you so much. Hemstead. So it's me and Nicole Austin, uh, Hemstead and, um, uh, Dave uh, Smith from from St. George and at one point uh, previous to this I'd given a talk in front of the American Single Malt Commission where I actually had sourced a lot of answers from I think some of you actually contributed about what we feel about uh, um, uh, EC and GN and, and Barley and, uh, and I had everybody's kind of like no one knew who anyone was but my name was up there as clearly Joe DeVee um, and Dave had seen that and immediately made fun of me, uh, which I deserved. I, I agree. Uh, but the the uh, we were on this t this blending panel, and this guy says, "Well, we've heard enough about blending from uh, the people who make whiskey, but we want to talk to the Brandy Boys over there." And so he immediately decided his new name was going to be O Davy. And we have talked about forming a podcast entirely that's a, trying to be a comedy routine about making brandy. That sounds great. I, I, you have a subscriber immediately. Just, it. just make it. I would it's called that. the brand. It's called the Brandy Boys, by the way. And and Dave is. I, I. It's gonna be harder for me because he's way funnier than I am. Everybody needs a foil, right? Yeah. <laughs> a straight man, straight man of the funny man. Jeez, Jesus, Demi. What? Yeah. what? How are you roasting this man? Abbott Christ. Costello, <laughs> um, no, I'll take it. I'll take it. I like the straight man. Dave's way too funny. Sorry, I did not mean for that to be a diss, um, but, you know, <laughs> no, I totally meant it. I meant to be mean. <laughs> um, OK, I just want to read a comment from Joe uh, Echo Fall in the chat. Uh, Phil Demi and the, I'm just reading it verbatim because uh, we don't actually have chat on screen, which is a thing that some Twitch streams do. Um, this feels like a good one, though. Phil Demi and the rest of the mods and regulars have played a huge part in creating the atmosphere that we have in the Lodge, and I'm eternally grateful for everyone who turned an impulsive decision to make the Whiskey Lodge into a great community. And I just have to say right back at you, Joe, thank you for creating that place that we could make our own. 
and being okay with that because we've definitely <laughs> taken it in some ways probably different from the what you had intended. <laughs> Uh, and he also says, if I had a dollar for every time I got a tag for Joe in Discord, that was actually for Joe O'Sullivan. <laughs> you could probably yes, buy a bottle, buy of, a McCarthy's. bottle of McCarthy's. Yeah. <laughs> you, could, you could probably do that. Uh, as a, he has a much newer, he has a much newer, um, as a much newer additive or addition to the Discord, I suppose. Always did confuse Joe and Joe to V. Honestly, was 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 always was a bit confused by that ever since I joined. But I'm also quite relatively quite new. I think I've only been there about a year now or so. Honestly, but yeah, um, I did want to. So I know that that Demi actually has a lot of questions for you, Joe. So I did want to yeah, let's get back, back to over him. in his quest in his in his direction right here. Yeah, so I wanted to anchor as much as possible these questions around the most recent release because I think that it does uh, the six-year McCarthy's uh, mm -hmm. from Double Mountain uh, Wash, mm -hmm. which we've already covered. Finished in Oloroso from Castanolia, uh, which we've already covered. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think uh, talking mm -hmm. about where and when and how this liquid was distilled and by whom could be interesting because as you've alluded to, uh, there are now three distillers who've had a hand in this product. If I'm not mistaken, there's you, there's Caitlin Bartlemy, and there is, uh, Garrett Trotter. Um, there's, there's four, there's, there's four, there's a secret distiller too. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, his name is Daniel Ruiz. Uh, so Daniel and I grew up in Clear Creek together. He is the person who was running Clear Creek in Portland as I was moving and planning on taking over responsibility in Hood River. And Daniel is, um, he's incredible. I, I don't think he promotes himself enough. Uh, I, I, he's, he's starting a new kind of like brandy house right now. Um, I'm going to be promote. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know when it's getting going and, and I'll be promoting it. Um, but no, he's because of this 2023 release. That means the stuff is six years old, which means it was all made in 2017, which means that it's made by a combination of both. Daniel, as well as the new team of Caitlin and myself and designed by Garrett, who in many ways is spiritually the next stage if he chooses to stick around. But Caitlin and I are realizing like I'm off, I'm in my mid forties and I'm tired. And at some point I'll stop having as much active influence over things. And, and there's other people who need to have control when that happens. And uh, so it's, it's, it's a very interesting release. It's a very cool release in, in some sort of higher philosophical ways. I absolutely agree with that. Um, and the other follow on from that question uh, and that note that you made about moving from Portland to Hood River um, is that this six year old liquid, if I'm not mistaken, has aged in both warehouses. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's aged in both places. And the difference between the two is pretty dramatic. Uh, how the proof dropped in portland versus rises in hood river and the in the weird flex and rubbery expansion of aminos that that puts on to the liquid in it like there's going to be you know this is this is one of those ones where there's not going to be a tremendous inc there's not going to be a lot more of these that ended that that were in two places and that's kind of a cool thing. Uh, for Clear Creek, it's going to be the older expressions of the apple. They were planning on doing a 12-year and, and some 14-year slash 15-year single barrels next year. Um, and those got the Ooh. same treatment. Uh, but uh, for McCarthy's, until we release the theoretical 12-year that we're currently aging up, this might be the last of those that, that were in two cities. Well, there you go. A monumental achievement to send off the legacy of uh, the old distillery. It's it's one of the it, 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 from a high perspective, when you explode it and break apart all the interesting ideas in it, this is one of the neatest releases we've had. Uh, so there was a there was a question in chat, which I'm going to rephrase 
to sort of fit into a question that I wanted to ask you. Um, so for those who don't know, um, I've, uh, I, I have this bad habit of assuming that uh, the audience knows what I know, um, which is obviously not a fair thing to assume. Um, I want to clarify uh, to what extent uh, McCarthy's is aged in Garyana Oak. Oh, like entirely. It's all Garyana Oak. Well, it's 99.9% .9 Garyana Oak because the first very barrel that we ever aged McCarthy's in was a French Oak and we it still holds liquid and I'm not going to stop it because that's... I'd rather like tell the, the tiniest of white lies when it's 99% plus of... Uh, um, uh, of Oregon Oak and then and then if there's one like one barrel out of 500 like yeah that's the traditional barrel that's like where that's the wellspring right so um yeah that one's in there but for all you know realistic claims that thing can't contribute anything more it's just until it decides to leak I'm going to keep it in there it's good for whiskey storage if nothing else it, yeah I mean it's also like you know I'm be romantic about something for, yeah that's yeah. that's what you gotta do um, it's part of the heritage and the legacy. Exactly. So, so we Jordan did gloss Dango, over. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, Jordango over in the comments has uh, has said something that I'm actually um, in in agreement with. Um, I actually have never heard of Garyana Oak before. Uh, do pardon my uh, my my ignorance, but do tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, let's take a or, step back and say and say people cool. people. Let's not assume people know what we think <clears throat> they know or what we know. Tell us all about Garyana Oak. Okay, so uh, this is really cool. Uh, you asked to really prepare for pain, everybody. Uh, <laughs> Garyana set a timer Oak for is... twenty minutes. No, 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 no. <laughs> set a timer for three and see how fast I can go. Um, uh, Garyana Oak, Oregon White Oak, exactly the same thing. The name of, um, you have Quercus Robert, Quercus Alba, that's American White Oak, and Quercus Garyana. Garyana Oak is Oregon White Oak. Quercus Garyana, Gary Oak. And that's, it's all just different names for all of them. It used to be called Oregon White Oak, but the reality is it grows anywhere from like really Big Sur up to Alaska. So like, let's not pretend it's just an Oregon. There's a combination of, there's not a lot of people who make it. There's one amazing cooperage down in McMinnville, Oregon called Oregon Barrel Works run by a guy named Rick DeFerrari, who's the one who taught me basic cooperage repair. Man, do I respect this guy. And uh, that is what is the entirety of McCarthy's aging vessel. So that's entirely what we age in. There's one really cool difference if you say, why do we have this different oak? Botanically, uh, if you look at the edge of a tree, this is the bark. This is the dead center of the tree. The majority of the tree is dead wood, and it's just there to support the living organism of the tree. The exterior is a xylem. That as well as the bark outside of that. But the xylem is what transports fluids from the leaves down to the roots, from the leaves to the roots, roots, leaves, leaves, roots, over the years that it grows. There's one issue that's probably obvious, right? Like, if it transports liquid passively, because it's not organ, it's not pumping, it's a tube. If it transports li liquids passively, from these two things when it wants to shut down and expand you can't fill a whole tree with liquid it's not a cactus so how does the tree just keep the exterior alive the interior dead but structural which is why you sometimes see like lightning struck trees that are hollowed out in the middle but still leaving or leafing at the at the branches so how do they do that the tree deposits something called tylosis Tylosis is a gum-like structure that the tree blocks the capillary action of the xylem to allow for um, the shutdown of fluids throughout the tree. Cool, right? So with that done, there's two types. There is hard tylosis and there is soft tylosis. Soft tylosis are found in French oak and Oregon oak. 
hard talosus are found in American white oak. So while these all are oaks, they have different botanical significance for this one function. With hard tylosis, a typical well-made barrel will require 36 months of air drying as opposed to kilning to allow for the proper humidity that at oak stave can be toasted and shaped and bent without actually breaking and to make a good barrel. With soft tylosis, you have the ability to use those 36 months to take the hard gum-like structures and break them down. Those 36 months allow for deeper penetration into the wood for a greater extraction of aminos and vanillins, not vanilla, vanillins that change and shape the spirit itself. So why all Oregon oak? Because it was different, because it was innovative, and hell, it's fun. But it takes, you know, like McCarthy's has a shit ton of peat in it. And that is what makes it a really good spirit and a, for a good barrel. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Yeah, great answer. Hey. Uh, I hope that that was... need to rewatch that answer at the end of the podcast at some point. Yeah, that was information um, dense for sure, yeah. Oh, man, it was. Uh, oh, that's amazing. Thank you for that. Let's get even a little I, more nerdy on it. You should. I, I, I asked you if you were if you were ready for pain. I, I, I kind of warned you guys. Oh, I'm going to double down now. Uh, so some time ago, I think it was probably two years ago or something like that. Um, you shared a table with us in the Whiskey Lodge of uh, the, the flavor contribution differences between Quercus Alba and Quercus Gariana. Um, now, we don't have that slide handy. But maybe you could uh, give us the high level summary of the differences in flavor contributions from the two types of oak. Um, one of the best ways that I've heard it described is uh, about, I'm going to start with Quercus Gariana, Gary Oak, Gariana Oak, Oregon White Oak. By the way, One of we, the better... we, we gamers keep laughing at Gary Oak. I try not to say Gary Oak because I can't do it with a straight face. Um, is there? I, I think I, this is outside of my gamer knowledge. Uh, the Pokemon Red Gary Blue. Oak Pokemon? What? Yeah. You're shitting me. <laughs> I'm way too old for that shit, man. I was in college during Pokemon. That's Pokemon crazy. Red and Blue version and like the season one of and probably season lots of seasons of the anime. Uh, the rival was named Gary Oak. I was oh, born was, in the seventies. Gary Oak was the doctor. Gary Oak was like the Pokemon guy. Wow! Am I the, suddenly I feel like I really am the youngest in this podcast. Oh my god! Wait, what now? Gary, 19... Oak, Gary Gary Oak, Oak, Oak is the is the guy who teaches you about Pokemon. No, no, that's his Professor is, Oak. His, no. his son oh, is my, Gary. Wait. Wait, what the nephew, fuck is the professor's is name? Gary. I'm sorry. No, I've gone I've gone on an erroneous <laughs> tangent. I'm so sorry. I've accused you of things. What what is what is Professor Oak's name? Oh wait, hold on. So this is information that it, I don't it, it, I it's, it's, know. It's Barry Oak. I didn't know, and Genji is enlightening us. The professor's full name is Samuel Oak. Gary Oak is his Ooh. grandson. Oh. What? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Samuel? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This, is, this is takes a very dramatic turn away from our subject topic. What I was actually going to just talk about before I got so 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 wrapped up in this is the fact that um, Demi has just single handedly uh, decided, um, and maybe we always were were destined for this, I suppose, but has decided to take our podcast from a nerd podcast to a nerd podcast. My my lord, we're getting deep into this shit, aren't we? <laughs> I mean, oh, just you wait. Just you wait. <laughs> uh, I haven't, I haven't properly broken on this podcast yet. So there we go. We've done it. Um. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, what were we talking about? Yeah, what were we? Because I also <laughs> forgot. Damn. Okay, I'm sorry we're... about that. We were about to get extremely nerdy about the uh, influences of Gary Oak on flavor versus the influences oh, yeah. of yeah. So, uh, Eastern yeah. White the, Oak. Um, 
yeah apologies for continuing to kind of like contribute to derailing the otherwise important questions <laughs> um <laughs> that the, the was yeah so, my so fault. that was entirely my fault uh gary on oak fault, my guy <laughs> gary on oak because it has those like softer tylosis and that allow for the breakdown of the xylem um you can get this really amazing penetration into the oak itself and so you get a greater extraction of the delicate aminos the vanillins and the sh wood sugars that are part of the wood itself all right um uh typical sommelier that i spoke to or not typical actually a, a very well-spoken sommelier I, I i was speaking to at one point described it as uh oregon white oak as the uh, marriage of a fresh scraped madagascar vanilla bean and a twist of burned orange peel and i think that that's actually like kind of brilliantly simple it's two things i can understand and i'm like yeah it does have those that little bit of like i love it but it's mean uh aspect of burned orange peel and the bitterness and the oil the scorch the scorched oils that go with that but it it, it also has that like deepness and the richness of vanilla and when vanilla is done right so that would be Oregon oak or Garyana oak. Um, American white oak doesn't get the same uh, penetration. And the vanillas, while I think they're at a higher ratio, you just don't perceive as much. And I think that's typically because, you know, with the Oregon white oak, we're, we're doing like a medium toast. We're, we're not really trying to affect the wood that much we really respect the the wood itself the oak and what it can do we don't want to alter the flavor of that wood american white oak maybe it's i, th I think it's as much cultural because we're so uh familiar with with bourbon and 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 what our understanding of what oakiness is via bourbon we still just do a lot of number one chars. I, I would love to experiment more with alternate chars of American white oak, but um, it still has the issue of you don't get the same depth of penetration. You don't get the same uh, tylosis breakdown botanically. And, you know, I personally am going to say I don't have the level of experiment experience to to know what that will do or what we're able to get out of it. For the time being, though, the versatility of a Oregon oak is so similar to a French limousine oak that we have a lot of room to keep on having fun before I think we have got tired of this toy. So, from a woodworking perspective, I've uh, I've done some woodworking with uh, Quercus gariana and with Quercus alba, both in the uh, category of uh, of barrel staves. Um, and I will say that the bourbon barrel staves that I have worked with all just sort of lose that you know the the smell of the whiskey and the very um very uh heavy barrel uh, uh not barrel uh whiskey influence very quickly but the uh, uh quercus gariana that i have turned remained very pungent in terms of the uh whiskey or the spirit that it held and i find that interesting because it was very definitely i mean in use for much longer but also uh held the the influence of the spirit for a lot longer i can see that i mean i i do also a bit of woodworking and the projects that i've used barrels for i have this one barrel that i dropped um it's barrel 126 i i remember it it's etched on my brain when you drop a full barrel of whiskey you kind of feel like you're a dick for 
forever. And uh, the reality is I, I've been trying to make amends by making projects out of this. And when I make a box or I make a gift for somebody, uh, yeah, it's um, it really does linger. It really, really does. Uh, Phil, I need to send you more of that wood. I will say that my wood shop has never smelled better. I'll send you some. Just please remind me. I'll send you a full stave. I, th I think I have a few left. I want to acquire Ooh. some of this woodwork name. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I don't, I don't have any in front of me. Disclaimer: We're not shilling anything here, but uh, we're totally shilling. Uh, <laughs> Phil does make uh, lovely pens and other such things out of bits of wood, barrel staves, and so on. Oh. I've always wanted one, and someday maybe I'll have one. <laughs> they exist in theory. So, uh, <laughs> one question. Uh, one question that I've had for a while that's sort of a... a uh, probably strange process question. Uh, when... When the uh, uh, wash is being... Uh, brewed off-site. Um, what does that smell like? Uh, so like, what does it smell like in the brewery itself? Yeah. Oh, God. Like, I mean, it's great. And it's unique because of the phenol content that's coming off the barley. It's really rich. I, I, have, uh, I have the unique experience of um, being... Um, uh, uh, verbally singled out by many a brewer at any brewing conference because of, in 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 yeah, the, the, these kind of verbal assaults are coming from like the deepest level of love and brotherhood. But apparently, Pete Reek is really horrible to scrub out. So I, I've made a lot of um, FNGs work extremely hard to get the smoke out of the brew lines of Windmere and Double Mountain. Particularly Windmere, I, I think I've abused the most over the years. And so occasionally, yeah, I, I get called out for just at, at, at like a brewing or distilling conference for being the guy that, invo that uh, sadistically put pain on people. I, I enjoy that role. I think it's a really good one. I think I'm good at it. And I'm going to keep on doing it. But what's really kind of nice about the actual smell is it's there's a deep sourness to it that I didn't really expect when it's coming off of the 100% um, barley fermentation. And there's this, the smoke itself, it feels very confined. And so it feels like it's coming, you know how... Let me think of the best way of saying this. You have a little pocket of this scent. It's all inside of it, and that's when it's in the beer. And then during the distillation, because you break it down, those phenols come out of solution, and they flow throughout the room. So you, as you distill it, can kind of sense this idea of transformation, where it was tiny within the barley, it's a little bit bigger in the beer, and when it's finally hitting the barrel, it's kind of reaching its teenage years, and it's expanding, and it's growing, and it is getting stronger. And um, over time, it, it, it hits a peak, and that might be the three year, I largely expect, but after that, it starts to decline again. And so there's a real life to McCarthy's, and it's one of the things we pay attention to specifically for the phenol content. This suddenly has me realizing the, the that, next uh, question we didn't bother explaining the full flavor profile of McCarthy's or what goes into it for people who may not have been acquainted. So here we are, an hour and ah. a half into our interview, explaining that not only is it aged in Gary Oak, it also is a peated spirit. And uh, yeah, by, by wow. the way, by the way, it's also a single malt. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, yeah, we kind of glossed over all of those points, um, which is kind of hilarious because I am I am the uh, the biggest evangelist of American single malt uh, that I know in the communities. Obviously, the producers are doing more than I am. 
Um, you are the person. Oh, yeah. You are you are single handedly one of the people that that inspired me to actually try to be in this industry, Demi. I'm, I'm gonna be yeah. honest, like when I first popped in here, I was I was a, I was a sommelier living in a place that did not drink wine. I was not sure what I was going to do with my life. You 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 are one of the people that have convinced me to be part of this. To be very clear with you. Yeah, uh, Doug, don't don't sell yourself short, man. Like you're, I I routinely refer to you as one of the best whiskey reviewers that I know. I get more insight from your comments than, I mean, really anyone else. Like I genuinely, you got some, you got you, you got clout, man. Like be okay with it. You're, I I at least people that met you, like we think you're cool as hell. Well, thank you very much. I'm trying not to let it go to my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't let it go to your head. I, no, I, I still no. want to. I still want to hang out with you. I would never want to truly compliment Being... you. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, Phil, you had Being another question. Being sort of, uh, yeah, uh, sort of writing the coattails of that question is the um, again sort of a probably strange process question when you are distilling. Uh, Anything that has a relatively high phenol or or other, uh, you know, I don't want to say impurity because I love it so much, but it's sort of one of those, you know, different sort of chemical components. How careful do you have to, like, manage the temperature of your mash as you're distilling to make sure that you're getting as much of that as you can without pulling up other uh, less desirable components? That's a really good question. And, and it just so happens that luck is in our favor on this one. Like it, it doesn't have to take any different brewing effort. I mean, there's things that do matter. Mill size matters. And, um, it, but it's just about like diastatic efficiency. I, I forgive me if I pronounced that wrong. It's not like it's a word I say every day. Um, you know, it's 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 really just about the efficiency of the barley and the conversion of uh, it to sugar. And so the phenol kind of goes along um, pretty accurately. Uh, McCarthy's is forty parts per million. One of the more interesting things, and I think for anyone that's involved that that wants to follow um, peated whiskey, should be aware of is the 2022 drought that Scotland had, and as a result, uh, McCarthy's for the releases of the barley that we're about to distill next week, they're 25 parts per million. That's the highest level of phenol that we were able to to get. We're welcoming the change. Like, there's just so right on the record, like, we're having fun with this because we don't have a lot of choice. Um, but phenol is going to be an interesting kind of how way of how we handle this. And um, uh, while it's not affected by the brewing process, there's other elements that are coming into play that involving climate change that we didn't really expect. I mean, who would thought that climate change was going to change how smoky your whiskey is? But it's had an, an amazing immediate effect in the last year or so. Especially considering all the wildfires, you'd expect that smokiness is something that might be increasing rather than decreasing. Obviously, Quite honestly, yeah. How it works. <laughs> I was going to say, like, we've, we've seen some really interesting brandies emerge from the smoking process. And I, my heart goes out to the winemakers. Um, I hope we can find a balance where maybe the industry changes dynamics a little bit so everyone can find something really good and still make a, a life for themselves in this industry. Because uh, honestly, smoke, should... smoke brandies are cool. Like, they're freaking cool. One of the things that, that should be noted, yeah, is that um, is that these uh, as as these wildfires have apparently played a very interesting role in your industry for the wine industry and things like that. Um, smoke taint in grapes is both noticeable and not very good um, for them. 
Yeah. Well, I, I have... Yeah, that's... Yeah, uh, Joe. I guess I was going to say, I think... I'll a leading question. Do I understand correctly that you still have aging a barrel of brandy that was from smoke-tainted wine? Yeah, and that's kind of what I was getting at. Like, um... I want to, in breaking it up between vineyards, wineries, and distilleries, maybe for some of these wildfires, like, you know, we don't as individuals have the same control over it, but our industry is really scrappy. And um, I think there's a lot to be said for the quality of and it's the saddest thing ever and so my pitch has always been to take proceeds from this and not to to make money off it but to take proceeds from it and make sure it goes to wildfire research but like we did do an experimental batch based off the eagle creek fire which decimated decimated the columbia gorge it was horrible um and we've played around with it and and we did a batch based off of that wine we bought the wine at cost so the winemaker didn't lose anything this was like purely they came to us and asked us to buy it. And we said, what did it cost you make you to make it like we actually kind of thought it was going to be garbage. But the brandy came out like really cool and, and interesting. So I'm not celebrating something negative. I'm purely saying that we can readjust the industry and uh, give, you know, I, I just hope we give back to the issues of climate change that resolve around it, but we can try to spin something terrible into something halfway celebrated. Um, as long as we keep the values that go into creating it in the, in the, in the causes in mind. So, um, it's a little bit of a difficult thing. I know that, I know that there's a lot that can be misconstrued in it. Cause I think we're all trying to figure out what it might mean to deal with the modern world as f fermentation people. But, um, you know, we can't also just ignore that this is happening either. And, and if it means that we make smoky brandy, like, well, smoky brandy is kind of good. Like, let's just give back some of the proceeds to just to, to making this a little bit better on each other. Yeah, it is a very cool experiment. Uh, I've so, gotten to taste a little bit of it. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about how you feel that comes out, because if it is a direction that the industry must go for better or worse, um, uh, knowing that it's an interesting product is good, but could you talk a little bit about what the distillation process does to the tainted wine? Um, <clears throat> so whether it must goes, I have no idea. I'm just trying to toss out an answer because I have none. Like I literally have nothing at all. So I'm spitballing as best as I can. And I got a lot to learn, I'm sure. Um, that being said, I, I, what's been really kind of neat about it is there's initially you have the smoke when it's the new distillate and it's on top. No matter what you do, it's it's hovering an inch above the liquid in terms how it hits your nose. You get the smoke, there's a pause, and then you get the liquid. Put it in a barrel a year later they're maybe a little bit more matched up. Over time, that smoke seems to dissipate and sink. And you get this really interesting balance of some like more petroleum. I love I I love a terrible tasting note, but like you get like an industrial aspect of it. Um you get a lubricant aspect of it. I all things that make me interested. I'm only responding to how I like to describe things. But like WD-40 is kind of amazing. And I, I think that this is a different aspect of flavor that I've seen before in a brandy because it is going against the typical fruitiness that you might get in a grape spirit. Um, I want I, it, it's an it's 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 the best case of trying to make a uh, silk purse out of a sow's ear. I don't know if anyone says that other than my mom, but it, there is, some, you know, for an old um, um, adage, it, it, you're making the best case out of a scenario, but like you can still do some cool stuff. 
Um, the only real negative things that I ever find in wine that I can't get rid of are sulfites and uh, volatile acids. Uh, other than that, uh, you can kind of play with some things. And if it helps, if if smoke brandy helps distillers make some money from when they can't sell their cleaner brandy and it helps vineyards not lose an entire year's growth on the vine like that's that's good and if it helps wineries like they can't help what they get like none of us can we're just as much victimized by it by you are and um yeah it's 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 kind of cool i just hope that we try to make a try to give back a little bit i i would hate for this to be the kind of thing that we're accused of making money on like it feels dirty um you know hopefully that works hopefully we can do so but check it out if you get the opportunity so, just check it out that's all i gotta say I, I will say as a consumer uh i i don't think that i would ever think about it that way it doesn't doesn't feel like a money grab to me it feels like Good. Making Good. the best of a bad situation. You've done right by the wine producers. Uh, you you have created an interesting experiment, which should be an interesting product, hopefully. Um, and uh, and everybody's got bills to pay. So uh, if you make an interesting product yeah. and it sells, and you know that pays the bills, I don't see any problem with that personally. I, I mean, I just personally, I would pay a couple of bucks more if I knew that the difference went to a. Um... Yeah, here I'm like kind of like trying to make an argument at our CFO, like on the spot. Uh, I would always charge more for something that I was like, oh yeah, I'll pay more for that if five bucks goes to that, it goes to wildfire things and it goes to keep this company going. That's a small company. Like I would have, I, I like those sort of things. I, I'm a big, I'm a big sucker for a cause. Like I'm a horrible sucker for a cause. Speaking, I suppose, as someone who is um, at this point a wine consumer and not and not as far into the industry, a critical support to people who who have, I suppose, suffered from from this uh, winemakers who have lost lost crops to this sort of to the smoke thing. Um, but also, I suppose, a somewhat more maybe callous comment, maybe not. Um, the circumstances under which we are talking about have been uh, historically very prominent, I suppose. A need arises in which to create a brandy, a spirit, uh, something like that, um, to to sort of maintain a wine to change things. This is, um, in some cases, both how Port and Madeira and other fortified wines like it came to prominence. Port um, came quite a lot to prominence during the uh, the embargo of a lot of French wine during the uh, mm -hmm. Napoleonic Wars to uh, Britain and places like that. Um, Madeira wine came about because of a need to ship to the New World and things. These are uh, problems that we face that create very interesting both spirits and wines and things like that. And I think that insofar as that influence, it is valuable as far as the influence of um, uh, global warming and things like that, it is in many ways tragic. But I think that uh, th there, I suppose, can be silver linings, can be benefits to a lot of these these things that we're talking about right now. I mean, this people is are robust and industries will find a way because people always find a way. I, I agree with Phil on that one. That's exactly what I was going to say. Like, you know, we're, uh, we, we still got to survive. Uh, this is the darkest point of our of our conversation so far. Let's find something better. Uh, OK, well, I. <laughs> I had, gotta, some, I had some questions that might might be borderline on that. So instead, I'll ask the other questions I had, which are kind of fun. Um, so uh, first of all, um, can you guys peruse the chat to see if there was uh, if there was any other good questions that came up? Um, there was one, but I'm worried I, I I'm going to cover to the most it. recent one. Uh, so first of all, so McCarthy's just to state in plain terms once again for the audience, McCarthy's Oregon single malt whiskey is an American single malt whiskey, which means it's made from 100% malted barley, um, and it's a it's a new standard under development in the in the United States. But it's basically to match, um, to fit within the United States spirits laws while also matching what the rest of the world does for single malt. Single malt being the style of whiskey that is currently um, Scotland's most famous style of whiskey, um, as well as 
Japan's most famous style of whiskey and so on. It's basically the, it's the cachet um, type of whiskey in the world. So that's what McCarthy's Oregon single malt is. Um, it is a smoked whiskey, which is somewhat traditional in scotch. Um, and it currently uses uh, smoked barley, uh, peat smoked barley directly from Scotland. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you, uh, in light of global logistics and peat shortages that we've been hearing about, um, and also to address, uh, the chat's question, uh, have you experimented with other sources of peat or other ways of drying the barley? Uh, so, um, have we experimented with other sources of peat? Yes. It's a, oh, not for McCarthy's, though, but for additional expressions. To change the, 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 the flavor characteristics of Northwest peat versus Scottish peat are night and day. They're, they're just not the same darn thing. Uh, so we're not going to be able to reproduce the flavor characteristics that we get over there, over here. And uh, a 20-year slow shift is, like, not the kind of thing that we're going to be able to pull off. So if we're going to do something different, we're going to be using a smaller maltster who can do something really cool with Northwest barley or Northwest peat. And we have, I mean, we, we are spoiled with the number of quality malting houses that are out there. Um, I, I can't, it's, it's like literally difficult for me to spotlight one because they're all so great. And that's Skagit Valley Malt and Admiral Malt and, and, and everyone down the line. Like, it's phenomenal to have this part of the industry rise and to often be horribly unrecognized. You're going to see a lot of distillers in this world. We're not thanking our maltsters enough. Those guys do great work. And craft malting is key to our success. So thank you, craft maltsters. Um, so yeah, another expression, we're going to be following more direct to region guidelines, but that's just because we believe in supporting our neighbors. Will we be changing the base malt for McCarthy's? Absolutely not. We have a heritage with Baird's. We have a heritage with Great Western Malt. We have a heritage with these malting houses, and there is only three three distilleries in the united states that get this malt and i will not say who they are but we are the oldest and we are the grandfathered in and i'm not giving that up because that this is like like i said mccarthy's is a bridge i want to challenge the idea that regionality has to determine what you have why and so if we can make something that is in part in the older tradition of single malt that we are defining American single malt by, and in part with a new concept of aging in wood and oak, that is fantastic. I like where we're at. So McCarthy's is always going to be that spot. It's just going to be because I refuse to not. But the uh, the for any future expressions, yeah, we're going to be sticking with like the guy down the road. Um, we just, the guy down the road was in high school or elementary school when we started making McCarthy's. So it didn't really, it wasn't an option. Well, it's great to hear that you've got your, your source of peated malt secured well into the future. It sounds oh, yeah. like, uh, which is, which is a big relief, uh, given some news we've seen in the last year coming out of Scotland about, uh, peat shortages. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will say Before, on a personal note, no. I'm I am I'm excited about Pacific Northwest peat. Uh, there are there are two expressions on the market that use Skagit Valley peat at the moment. Um, I believe uh, I believe Oregon is also trying to develop local peat, but I haven't heard much about that directly. Um, I like the idea of using peat that has more of a sense of co-location with the whiskey's production, uh, more of a sense of place, if you will. Um, I won't go so far as to say terroir. Some people uh, 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 object to that in the world of whiskey because there are so many factors between the ground and the glass. Um, but a sense of place, I think, is definitely warranted, and uh, it's nice to it's nice to co-locate these things when we can. Um, 
Uh, a follow-on question from the pawn, is drying with something like hickory not possible? Or I'll throw on mesquite, and I will say, it is. And the question, right. yeah. the question to I, Joe... I have words on this. Yeah, the question to Joe... Oh, I be, also have a lot of words of... on this myself. <laughs> no, I, I have nothing to say in this. Uh, Ian, this is all you, man. Like, I, I am in no authority for these other things. Ian, please. Damn, all right. So a lot of pressure here. Right. So um, the the drying with other materials than peat is... um. I suppose we'll start with this very long historic question. Historically, people would dry um, uh, malt and things like that with things that were available, but this is not as much my knowledge base. I will, I will admit, and there's not um, that many available things that are going uh, on in the in that sort of field. But um, I, I suppose I will say I work at a place uh, that actually malts with things other than peat. We uh, at Del Bach will make a mesquited whiskey. Uh, this is, in essence, the same, roughly the same process as actually malting with peat and things like that. You will, um, you will take your grain, you will let it germinate, and then you will essentially kill it with the heat from smoke uh, that was used for, in the case of Del Bach, mesquite rather than peat. Uh, mesquite wood is a native southwest uh, wood. You'll find it in certain places in California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and a lot of Mexico. Uh, mesquite wood is primarily used for things you'll recognize like smoking, uh, meats especially, and things like that. Um, it has a very distinct smell, very woody, uh, somewhat reminiscent of tobacco in certain cases. Pipe smoke and uh, cigar smoke especially, but we'll, we'll t I'll talk about it probably in a minute. You'll sometimes get a little bit of cigarette smoke in there as well in certain particular cases. But um, at Del Bach, we will primarily malt um, uh, mesquite whiskey or get in malted whiskey that is unsmoked. When it's smoked with the mesquite whiskey, it acquires a significantly more, uh, I suppose, woody scent, sometimes <clears throat> sweet, sometimes much more reminiscent of things like campfire and things like that. Um, I realized just now I've probably been talking for quite a while about this particular topic, so I'll probably try to speed it up a little bit. Um, but uh, with mesquite smoke, you achieve a very similar actual process. You achieve a very similar uh, end result. Uh, but the flavors therein are going to be somewhat different than uh, peat. Um, uh, we've talked a little bit about American peat versus Scottish peat and things like that, and that is not a sort of divide that I'm going to get into right now. But essentially, the material that you um, smoke with is going to have a very, very distinct difference on the actual end flavor of that result. As, as I've just uh, said, mesquite smoke is going to be a little bit uh, woodier in general, rather than medis some of the medicinal um, kind of, how to say, iodine-esque flavors of some of the Scottish malt, but nah, that gets into a very long conversation right there. Um, instead, it will have some somewhat woodier kind of almost cigarette vibes. I currently have the um, uh, Ode to Isla, our very, very smoky malt, and the McCarthy Three Year right now. McCarthy is going to be a lot more kind of maritime, a little bit um, more, a little bit lighter, a little bit more medicinal, just because of its both um, origin and its actual uh, smoking sort of varietal right here. Uh, the Ode to Isla right here is going to be a little bit more woody. A lot more campfire, a lot younger in many ways, and a little bit sweeter, just in that way the mesquite gives it. And I now realize that I've been talking for way, way longer than I probably should have, so I will pass it back to uh, Joe Duckfill and Demitaste right now. Thank you so much for no, giving you, me a little corner right here. You're all good. Uh, I'll add on uh, a Del list of expressions besides Delbach. Uh, Colkagan also uh, is smoked with mesquite, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Balconis does a scrub oak smoked uh, blue corn whiskey called Brim, uh, Brimstone, uh, which is actually oh, super um, cool. Joe, the founder of the Whiskey Lodge, that is one of his favorite whiskeys. And uh, that was the first time in several years when I tried that whiskey that I, I felt I had been uh, I'd been given a flavor profile that was completely unlike anything I had tried before um, in whiskey uh, in quite some time. 
Uh, so, um, and that one's a little different. I believe if I'm not mistaken, I think they smoke the, uh, they smoke the post distilled product as opposed to the, drying. Yeah. Product. They pump. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly that. As, as far as I can recall, they, they, they are, yeah, they're smoking the liquid, uh, post fact, um, which I think is really neat. And one of the things that we're coming across is, uh, in this industry is that, uh, the, technology of how things are peated or smoked in this country is extra extremely different than the well-developed agri you know infrastructure that, that the scottish have so um like i'm looking forward to how it develops i think you can expect a lot out of smoked whiskey in america but it may take another 10 20 years uh i guess throw out another example so, copper fox if i'm not mistaken is using uh cherry wood Yes. So Copper Fox is using a blend of cherry wood and peach wood. Uh, and they are not the only Virginia distillery that's using uh, more commonly found on the East Coast woods for smoking. Um, Copper Fox malts, uh, malts their barley themselves, which is cool, using, uh, like I said, peach wood and cherry wood. Uh, Merlarkey has the smokehouse whiskey which is another example of smoked after the fact uh they use white oak as their uh, uh source of smoke and there's a handful of uh like other smaller distilleries uh throughout the commonwealth that do uh interesting things with uh malting their own um malting their own barley using uh like I don't know if they're still doing it, so I won't say their name because if I'm wrong, it would be embarrassing. But there's a, a company in Appalachia that was using uh, hickory uh, to smoke their malt. Um, and uh, Cashel imports uh, peated malt, I'm pretty sure. The pond says Trailhead does an annual cherry wood, but not sure how. Is that a is that a malt whiskey or some other type of whiskey? I guess I can look that up later. As a sort of addition, I do remember actually, um, right before I first actually joined the Discord and things like that, I had I was very infatuated with Merlarkey, and I believe that you um, you and I had somewhat disagreement about what the smoke actually tasted like. Although I can't quite remember. I'm a big fan of, uh, of Merlarkey smoked whiskey myself, so I'm not quite sure what I remember there. But yeah. So uh, the pawn says it's a malt. So if it's malt, most likely that's uh, that's cherry wood malted, uh, like smoked malted. Yeah, as opposed to as opposed to a post fact smoked, which which is actually a fairly unusual thing. Uh, so yeah. if, if you had to guess, it's most likely, especially if malt is involved, it's most likely, uh, kilned malt where the smoke was introduced, um, into the drying process. Um, and I guess, uh, we could, we could bring this back a, a level of nerdiness and, and sort of explain what this is all about. Why do we dry and smoke the barley? So, uh, barley is a seed, uh, from a grass, basically, uh, you let it sprout or germinate. Uh, that starts creating the start that starts turning the starches into sugars and it's going to use those to grow. So before it has a chance to actually consume the sugar that it just created, you want to kill the plant and you kill the plant by drying it. Um, and so really the main thing is just heat it up until it stops growing. Um, and uh, in, in the, the more traditional times when things were less controlled, sometimes the smoke would mingle with the drying grain. Um, and so you would get the, and peat happened to be the fuel that they were using. So in that case, you got peat smoke. Um, and so the, uh, the requirement is to dry the grain. Um, the, uh, the, the style comes from whether you keep the smoke separate or what the source of smoke is and whether you introduce that and how much smoke you let get in there. Uh, so, and, and hence we have all these different types of things. Peat smoke has been the thing that has been the most common throughout the world. A lot of peated barley comes from Scotland. So a lot of places, especially in craft spirits, are moving to other fuel sources or other methods. I mean, it's a natural evolution of interest, right? So, you know, uh, like I said, Steve wanted this to be Oregon and Northwest 
repeated, but that technology didn't exist at the time. And now it does. And the best thing that this industry can do is continue to move away from its predecessors. If we want to keep American whiskey interesting, we can have reverence for the initial brands, uh, us, St. George, Westward, you know, down the line. But I hope to a certain degree that us old brands are continuously challenged uh, by the flavor development that's happening in newer distilleries um you know uh regardless of where they're at who are trying to do more interesting things because there we just there, there's such a richness of possibility of flavor design in what we do that like it's it would just be boring to sit on our laurels and and mccarthy's is going to continue to grow and even if we just play with scottish peter barley i guarantee you we're going to be able to provide good stuff it's one of the great things about craft distilling as well is this idea that you want to embrace what works and sometimes that means or what is efficient or what is economical and sometimes that means doing experiments and coming up with uh, new ways of doing things or, or interesting flavor profiles and that's just uh, instead of copying the last guy coming up with new things and hopefully it's successful and I can say in the case of Clear Creek almost everything that you've done that I've tasted has been successful delicious and and warrants its price tag which um i will say uh when i walked into a store to blind buy two liters of uh of pear brandy i was shocked to find that it was 70 dollars a bottle and i said well i don't have another plan for my barrel so i'm just gonna commit <laughs> um and it happened to be one of the greatest decisions that i ever made uh made one of my uh my my barrel produced as a result of that pear brandy some three or four different expressions that still taste like pear <laughs> <laughs> and some of the best stuff that's come out of my barrel. So very well worth it. We tried desperately to make pear vodka for a long time, and it just tastes like pear brandy no matter how many times we distilled it. That stuff is sticky. Uh, so there was a question that I uh, that I got that I promised to ask, um, and we've been talking a ton about whiskey here, and McCarthy's is not the only whiskey that Clear Creek makes, uh, but I think we can... Uh, let's at least make an honorable mention of uh, uh, Trail's End, uh, is a series of whiskey that uh, starts distilled in Kentucky, if I'm not mistaken, and then comes up to the Pacific Northwest where Clear Creek finishes that whiskey in a variety of different types of barrels. Uh, Gariana, uh, X apple brandy, things like that. Uh, this yeah, is a lovely I, series. Uh, feel free to comment. <laughs> yeah, I, McCarthy. I, I, McCarthy's has been my heart um, and, and, and will always be Trails End has been like this fun playground. And so there's there's a I I I know it sounds crazy and I talk to people about this all the time, but you can have more fun and more creativity if you only control one variable. Um a blank page is freaking boring. Uh coloring books are exciting. There's there's an interesting thing that can happen when you just have one thing to control. And when Hood River Distillers launched Trails End years ago, it was always to kind of define this concept of the trail between Kentucky and Oregon. It's a metaphor for the Oregon Trail. And, and, I, and the name suits it. Caitlin came up with the name. The name suits it great. It was fun. And, and it did really well. And right at the same time, we decided to kind of redo the label, readdress the information on it, which was a great decision. We also decided to have a hard look at what the rules around it were going to be. And so traditionally, the white label of Trails End is aged with Oregon oak staves. These are thin cut staves that are number one char to kind of give an idea of what the Oregon oak can contribute. We really quickly decided that that was too limiting, but we didn't want to give ourselves an endless amount of variables. And so it's still this product line that's entirely about taking something from Kentucky and aging it entirely in, or finishing it entirely in something that's representative of the Pacific Northwest. 
and whether that is and, and, and we want to tie it back to the history, right? Like that's part of it. Like there's nothing in the Columbia Gorge that m- doesn't make sense to use from a culinary and beverage background. We got wineries, we've got breweries, we've got great distilleries. And considering that <clears throat> Clear Creek being the third craft distillery in the U.S. starts here in in in, in the Northwest, we have like some tradition to go back to um <clears throat> you look at a spider graph of we all know a spider graph it's an xy axis and up here is like cereal and over here is um you know uh malt and whatever like it's got the four quadrants and we understand what's in there the, the idea of trails end is to kind of use this narrative of we are restrained to only this is the marketing aspect, right? We're restrained only to the things in the Northwest. We're defining the trail. We're going to use Northwest wine. We're going to use Northwest beer barrels. We're going to use, sorry, Northwest wine barrels, Northwest beer barrels, Northwest brandy barrels to flavor and develop this whiskey into ways that are different and it's a good value. Here is the thing that's happening beside, behind the scenes. We are exploding one quadrant of that spider graph. And so we're like, hey, you know, this uh, eight-year bourbon, we didn't make it, but, like, we're kind of in love with the chocolate aspect of it. How can we quickly highlight that and grow it and make it more unique? Well, we know this brewery down the road that has an incredible porter, and that porter was aged in old rum casks. So let's try this rum porter finished bourbon because it's a local brewery and brewing is a tradition out here like that's part of our craft in the northwest and so we're kind of, we're, we're we're keeping the restraints to being the culinary experience of out here things that have mattered we've donated many barrels to local beekeepers with the promise that they come back to us like it, the idea is that the the trail ends with what this region has developed, and we want to be a reflection of that. I mean, it's it's just kind of the perfect val the perfect amount of like we're doing it as an experiment, but there is a interesting and kind of beautiful poetry about it that that can be marketed really well, and I think that there's tremendous value in both. Like I like this story. The story is freaking fun. But for people who just like bourbon, this is all the same liquid. And you will get a better immediate understanding of what the influence of different finishes can be based off of this larger portfolio of Trails End. So I basically am making it for the one person that's going to be like, well, I have the apple. I have I have like six of the apple brandy and I got six of the the port the porter finish and i got six of the oregon oak states i got some of the oregon oak um i got some of the oregon oak uh, uh cask finish and to understand the differences between all of them uh we have like so much open room in how we develop this line that i've become a bit annoying with hood river distillers because i want to like i feel like i'm a dog that's pulling at the end of a leash because it's so easy for me to mess around with this but the balance is the thing that we can actually feel that we have ownership of um some experiments work out good some don't like uh sometimes they come out too dry and we don't really like it and we got to go back but, you know, there, there's something kind of cool to just mess around with one aspect of how this flavor is developed and to leverage it all on that. Because a lot of the time this is made by people we care about. And that's that's really fun. So Trails End's great. Like, I, I really like it. I just poured myself a bit of the Trails End 10, uh, which I think, yes, this is the Oregon Oak Casks. Uh, ten year. Uh, it's yeah, quite that's delicious. a cask it's, one. Uh, it's one of my yeah. That's a whole cask. I was going to clarify is that so you said staves, but this one is actually the full cask. Yeah. Right. So the ten is the full cask. The eight white label 
is the stave the red label is the apple brandy and we're working on a porter finish right now that's we're hoping to get out for this um we're hoping to release for this kind of like a you know fall so we'll see where it goes i will say this that one is like incredibly cool and i'm kind of i kind of hope we turn it into a little bit more of a regular thing but we can only stress our production so far it's just really neat like i i want to do if we don't if if we don't turn it into a regular thing i'm gonna argue pretty heavily that we revisit it again in a couple of years so we can have a wider release because it's good uh since you've mentioned that one uh i will say i've had a taste of it and i'm very excited for that to become a product that's uh, it's it's a real it's cool. cool one uh, a little a little bit polarizing <clears throat> if i recall um yeah but to my palate very cool oh that's my favorite thing i mean like i don't want to please everyone I, just, I want people to yell at each other a little bit you should talk about me it's better that way there you go uh there's a couple comments in the mm -hmm. chat i want to read um so on the note of uh the point about competing and seeking to improve or innovate on a formula reminds me of what i've heard from some beer makers about some very classic industrial beer in argentina where the quality is generally perceived to have dropped, but they replied with, the recipe has always been the same. It's just the people's palate that has evolved. Uh, that's a comment from Aleph G. I think there's a lot to be said for that. I, I, I One thing that I've, I've kind of turned to some of my peers, and, and I've been doing this since 2005, I'm... Um, if Steve and and uh, a lot of those other folks are the kind of proto wing of the, they're the founders. Like, um, Ian, when did Whiskey Del Bach found? It's got to be like early as hell, right? 2011 was when it was officially um, founded. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, well, hell, I can't believe I'm older than Whiskey Del Bach because. Um, that's your all right so first of all wait your guys are way too good for only being uh, uh for only being around since 2011 jesus christ uh it's second wild, of all right it's it's insane that's the, i feel really embarrassed now uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh but like talking to some of the older guard you know christian krogstad steve holly the folks that have been around in it since the mid 2000s like we're kind of that first wave you know we're, we're kind of the first time that anyone took notice and i've been pretty outspoken just by saying we're, we're like so much better now you know I, I i drink some of those older bottles of mccarthy's or pear brandy i'm like what the fuck is this or you know it's it sorry i shouldn't swear um what is this i think we're you know, well under is... quota for youtube bods uh i think that was okay, the first okay, actual okay. swear word we've had so far yeah 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 i oh, just told wow really yeah, yeah it wasn't it <laughs> um well it's it's up for a good reason um yeah like what is this it was it was not very good at the time and um and i will say i think we're far better now and that's entirely because we're learning from each other and uh i don't know how it will go another 20 years into the future but for the first group of people we know how bad we were we know how much we've learned from each other. And um, where we're at now has been a communal effort, no matter what. On the note of learning from the past, uh, this is a great segue to, to talk about a story that I, I feel like people need to hear more often. Um, tell me about that wild pair of bottles that you found at auction. Oh God, the uh, yeah. So that was one of the more fun things. Um, it started off as like paranoia. Uh, if you want a good description of her of humanity, it was. Um, it's entirely. Uh, it's entirely in this story. So like, I got alerted that out of Germany there was two bottles of McCarthy's that were for sale, and they wanted. They asked me if they if they were authentic, and. I scrutinized the images. Nothing seemed right. The paper seemed cheap. The 
the uh the the dates and the labels didn't make sense nothing seemed good nor was it traceable i went through every single single archive i could to try to find where these bottles came from and i could not trace them it was insane so what i did was i bought them i bought them for too much money and i was like i'm gonna buy this stuff i just need to know in the second I opened up that bottle, and yeah, it was not in any way something that's recognizable as McCarthy's now. But the funny thing was, I tasted exactly the whiskey that Steve McCarthy trained me on. And I hadn't, it hadn't occurred to me how much things had changed. Um, and how, I think that's a reflection of kind of drinking culture at the time, what we were looking for. It's kind of neat to see. And so, yeah, they were authentic. I don't know where they were. We didn't have dist distribution when those bottles were released to that country, but they got there. And um, I'm really proud to have a little bit of that time capsule. So to be clear, uh, you have a personal archive of many McCarthy's releases that I've seen. Uh, I believe it was well over yeah. a dozen bottles. Uh, maybe. Yeah, I... Uh... <laughs> it's about 40 something bottles right now no. uh and and they're they are very well kept like i have them in the creepiest place in my house which is this particularly terrifying basement and uh but at the very least it's out of sight of any light and it's also uh, out of sight of um any any real dramatic changes in heat so as long as vampires don't take over the world we're just going to be fine with my personal stash of mccarthy's and yes it is in that and so i consider it a funny little comparison between um oh so you, where McCarthy's so you is. personally bought those bottles and put them into your stash oh yeah not clear creek yeah uh okay so, so no 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 i bought them uh i was under the impression that clear creek was uh attempting to verify whether there was a fraud being committed um i didn't realize I mean, that you in fact personally bought those bottles and kept them for yourself so, so we so the, the reality is is that like i mean the, the reality is is that like this to this in many ways is a little bit of a reflection and a time span time stamp of where the where the spirit has been and where it is now and um i'm pretty proud of that that one little bottle so like, yeah we've opened it a couple of times i don't know if it's better uh now or then i don't think that's for me to judge but i it did give me in, insight into the changes that have made as a different generation comes into it which is really why i'm so fond of the oloroso finish um it's a different thing. You know, Garrett's having his influence. I hope he never joins the tasting parameters that uh, Caitlin and I have kind of set for each other. I like his influence and I hope it stays because he's freaking good at it. And so, you know, uh, it, it's, it's for me, a little bit deep into it. It's like there you do recognize that there's eras and there are Steve eras and I can taste it in a bottle and then there's you know me and caitlin and we can taste that in a bottle and then there's uh you know and i'm hoping that caitlin that, that garrett has his own but what's really gonna be interesting is that there's always overlaps and so between the steve and i is the daniel and between the me and garrett is the caitlin and it's it's you ultimately the larger reflection on how the tastes change changed is is so, so complicated um but it always comes down to the people who make it and and that's the one thing we can gu guarantee you that we're going to try to sell you is like we care and we're actually taking active interest into what this tastes like if you don't like it that's fine but uh, if you like it like that's great because we're deliberately trying to speak to you uh that's a good segue to a follow-up on an earlier uh comment uh that beer comment the follow-up was uh i reckon that happens a bit and one has to constantly innovate to stay at the top, uh, that happening being people's palates changing. Um, so cheers to innovation. Sorry about that, just plugging in my computer. Um, yeah, innovation's a big deal and be 
willingness to understand that it's that like you yourself need to like you yourself need to uh uh allow for innovation is the harder decision uh all right i have a few whoops we've uh we've lost a video oh no 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 i was i was just plugging in my computer so rather than tip okay. the camera towards my crotch i thought i'd spare you all that oh yeah I that... oh thank, thank you, you thank very you much yeah. i i i'm courteous you gotta admit that <laughs> absolutely uh so man it's 7 30 and i wish that we could talk uh i wish that we could talk at length about the brandies that we've alluded to but uh maybe that's for another time another interview um i think it would be good to close on some fun questions uh at this point that are that are um maybe less related to the specific products um so uh from your view on the industry right now um what is abundant and what is scarce Ooh, uh, whiskey specific or distilling? Open ended. Oh, Jesus, you're so mean. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So, what is abundant is passion, like distillers, buyers, um, people who are really trying to do things differently um uh but and and still try to develop flavor like we are in in the open minds that go along with it and and i have to say this i even start to see it now in vodka and that's that's something that i never would have guessed vodka is getting fucking interesting holy hell please pay attention to it there is good vodkas out there now like I say that as a distiller and as somebody that's made vodka, like it took me making one to understand th how cool that spirit could be. Um, so yeah, we got a lot of innovation. We got a lot of passion. What I think is scarce um, is the next stage. And, and that's something that we always have to keep in mind. Where do we take whiskey next? Where do we, what are the questions we should be asking? that's the harder thing to find and um i'm pretty i'm pretty sure that answers like i i have no doubt that the level of talent and restlessness that i see within my peers that question will be answered for now and forever so these sound like very vague answers but like i could just be like what is you know what is scarce like enough reviews of aged uh uh gin like barrel aged gin like but it, it we're, we're as a producer i'm focusing on other things like there is the best level of passion and talent i have ever seen in almost 20 years right now it is cool and it's not just producers it's people like you all like we are all the same people we're the same people and we're at different aspects in this we're in different fights in this battle but like we don't do we we have zero success without people who like can taste what we're tasting and celebrate it with us because like we'll die we'll die without y'all like both financially and spiritually it, we can't exist and so lots of passion um yeah, I, what I don't see enough of is like, okay, we're in a good spot. We like craft. We know what craft is. Well, let's start challenging all those questions. And so that will happen with the natural pendulum swing of culture that within any industry. And um, I'm kind of curious to see what comes next. Uh, breaking down some boundaries would be amazing. Uh, really doing a lot more collaboration would be cool. And I'm, you know, I hope that we have our own role in those changes at Clear Creek and Hood River Distillers. Uh, so uh, a follow on, um, sort of a follow on about scarcity, I suppose. Uh, what about unmalted barley? in the industry um i'm filling in some blanks I, I got two words the comment is unmalted barley question mark so i'm trying to fill in the blanks 
Uh, there's not enough done with it, and and I certainly can't speak to it uh, as any authority. I've done nothing with it. Um, there's some really cool notes in there. I don't know if I I would it would require a lot of work for me to feel like I had uh, appropriately learned how to tame unmalted barley. It's it's a it's a scary edge, but one that I think when the first person who does it great, like I mean great, they're gonna they're gonna really set a new standard for for the category uh i think i i can tag on my own answer to that and also answer another question from echo fall um who asks any alcohol related shows or documentaries that are must watches uh, my answer to that would be uh follow some podcasts actually i think uh, podcast content is is really doing a great job of being informative while also remaining light and conversational and uh, one in particular that I think answers the question about uh, unmalted barley in the context of Irish whiskey is um, the Whiskey Lore podcast has recently done a series yeah. of Irish whiskey distillery visits uh, leading up to a book. Um, but that whole series of at least a dozen podcast episodes that run for an hour or so um, was really informative about Irish whiskey, which is experiencing quite a renaissance right now. Uh, so, so industry at large, I think unmalted barley is making a bit of a comeback, but, uh, Irish whiskey in general is not limiting itself to unmalted barley. They are also producing single malts and even, uh, peated or turfed as they say, in some cases, um, sing, uh, single malts out of Ireland. Um, and then there's also Talnua in the United States that is making a Irish pot still style, um, blend of malted and unmalted barley whiskey. Um, I'll open up that question to everyone else. Must must see or must listen shows in the alcohol industry. So for I'm to gonna... be very f fair with this, um, and I'm sorry, sorry, Joe, for cutting you off right here. Uh, watch Sideways uh, for the for the wine industry. Not only did it uh, was it, is it a a fairly good movie, honestly. Uh, a actual real effect of uh, does to not to put too uh, not put too fine a point on it, but uh, tainting the name of Merlot in the American consumer's mind for a long, long time. Uh, but for more uh, actual spirit things, I think I probably should turn it over to my uh, co-host right here. I'm just going to back up whiskey lore. I, I mean, the, I, I'm going to not get too involved in this because I'm on a lot of podcasts and I love them all. Mm -hmm. But Whiskey Lore is doing something really cool. Uh, it's it's a really neat show. And and just, I think more importantly, find the one that you like. Find the one that's the length of time that you enjoy. And find the one that when you when it comes up on your pod feed, you're not just going to be like, well, I want to listen to another episode of like, how did this get made or something. Or stuff you should know, whatever. Like, it, there's going to be one that speaks to each of us. That's the best one for you. Go ahead, Phil. Uh, you are muted, though, I think. Nope. Ooh, still, still, still muted, I think. Oh, no. no. Oh. Could have, uh, could have lost just your just input, keep... maybe? I think we should just keep on telling him he's frozen. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Phil, yeah. You're yeah frozen. video's gone. Uh, can't see you at you're all. You're totally gone. <laughs> It's a black screen, man. Oh, no. Oh, wait, no, I actually can still uh, see Phil. Cast, Phil is panicking. Well, <laughs> <cast -trophic failure. laughs> Live updates on <laughs> Phil. Yeah. Things are not going um, well. Um, Phil, your search, your search history is, is broadcasting for everybody. <laughs> Phil, Phil. Uh, Phil, you plugged in something very large. Uh, you, I don't That's know. The That's the microphone. Oh, That's the microphone. Oh, no, you're right. It is the microphone, <laughs> isn't it? Um... It's at first I thought he was holding up a bottle of whiskey and I was like, well, that's a solution. <laughs> <laughs> there was a great old episode of Art Bell where he was working on his panel um, mid mid episode and trying to like connect some old stuff because Art, Art had now? like, yes, we got you now. Yeah, you're, you're there. Art. man. Uh, anyway, oh, yeah. Art Bell yeah. had glued his cigarette to his lip. It was one of my favorite episodes ever. That sounds fun. So, so uh, I have uh, a different mic. 
Um, so what I was saying is there are a lot of interesting videos on uh, on YouTube, including uh, I can't think of his name. Uh, uh, I believe he's German. Uh, did uh, a great series of tours of Scottish distilleries, and I uh, shared them occasionally in the uh, in the Whiskey Lodge, where he had uh, flown to Scotland and uh, basically did a tour of various distilleries um, with somebody. Uh, I think in a couple of cases uh, their master blender, and a couple cases uh their uh, head distiller or master distiller talking about what makes their distillery in particular special what makes what they do their own thing and uh uh i, I can't think of what his name is uh, it'll probably come back to me but those are some fascinating and fun videos because so much of it is you know, we're we're just doing what we love. Oh, and by the way, if you stand right here and look between those two warehouses, look at that view. And is it's just a really fun, fun uh, series of videos. Um, and I will try to remember what his name is. Uh, yeah, so uh, anybody who's got links to anything that comes up in this conversation, feel free to send to me afterwards. I'll add it to the uh, to the YouTube uh, notes so that uh, anybody watching has a better chance than our current chat to actually know what it is that we're talking about. Uh, I'd love to share links to the stuff that we're uh, discussing. Um, and uh, on that note, um, I'll reiterate, uh, none of this is sponsored. We talk about the brands that we talk about because we love them and we want to support them. Um, and that goes for all of the media and uh, and other producers that we recommend um, as well. Uh, so uh, I think I had, um, I had one more question. Uh, I feel like there was a good question that went by. Um, maybe we've answered all of them. Uh, yep. I had one. There was one question I saw uh, about whether we will do online sales in, in Oregon. Oh, Please yes, that's the one I was trying to remember. HRDspirits.com. We do ship within the states, and that would be the best place to go. Is that the continuous or just Oregon? Uh, that's just Oregon for now. We are, like many producers, un trying to understand the changing dynamic of uh, direct-to-consumer. Uh, we do not want to upset a process that has benefited us, and but it's a changing market. So um, organizations like Sealbox, they have their own license. Um, I love those guys, uh, and, and I encourage people to check out what they have. And in time, it would be my wishes to have more of our products on their platform. Um, so, but I'm, you know, there's, uh, I'm not so, uh, endorsing one particular, endorsing in media one particular outlet is not something I'm allowed to do. So I will also say, check out uh, a reserve bar in Drizzly. Uh, and if you can find us there, that's nice. If you, I don't know if you can, but definitely check out Sealbox because that's the third. And as long as I say three, I am legally protected. And I'll make sure to put all three of those links in the comments just mm -hmm. to cover those bases. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes. It's complicated. Uh, so let's see. One last question, maybe. Uh, is it, uh, it's 20 minutes to 8, uh, which I know I've is the end one. of our time. Um, wow. <laughs> it has flown by. Got one. Truly. Uh, yeah, Phil, please go ahead. So because I've been harassing you guys and uh, Becky and Scott Harris on Twitter, are you guys going to actually do something together? I've been waiting, man. <laughs> uh, I, the, the, the level I of together. love that, that we have with, with Becky and Scott uh, uh, is, is really huge. I, yeah, it's going to happen eventually. We all want it. Um, the last time I saw Becky, we were joking about having Creek Fest, which would just be all of the Creek distilleries getting together in one spot and seeing what trouble we got into. So it'd be like us and Bird Creek and Bear Creek and Cootaquan Creek and Clear Creek. Like it, we, it was just going to be a, a thing. Um, 
uh, for those who you don't know, uh, Catoctin Creek is like the, I, and forgive me, I'm still gun shy about pronouncing it correctly, despite the fact that I have like a half a dozen uh, bottles <laughs> in my in my collection right now. Um, one of the best distilleries in, in America, like hands down, amazing, and just the most charming people. So um, support them, support us. If we ever get a, a mutual appreciation, uh, if we ever, ever get a, a um, a manifestation of the mutual appreciation society that we have for each other that would be amazing and you know i uh, i i certainly we always talk about it so no actual anything in the works now but certainly the if we had more time in the day intention is well established uh i'm gonna plus one and say uh i've been okay. to whiskeys of the world uh showcase two years in a row and uh, the first one was, I guess, their first one after uh, after the pandemic oh. lockdowns had eased up. Um, and out of dozens of distilleries and dozens of whiskeys that I had tried in the course of the evening, um, Catoctin Creek stood out as one of the best. And I was sorely disappointed that either they weren't there or I somehow missed them the second year. Um, and uh, and the second year, uh, I would say uh, both years, um, Lost Lantern was there. And came in a close second to uh, Catoctin Creek, if I could even say. It's just a completely different style. So I, saying second just doesn't yeah. even feel right. Just a completely different style. Having uh, having Catoctin Creek and Lost Lantern there, even in the face of these huge brands and Scotch and uh, and the big players that bring out all the all the big special releases to stuff like this, uh, still Catoctin Creek was the one that left the most memorable impression on me that evening. Uh, the first year and then Lost Lantern uh, bringing some of the best releases, uh, some of the best taste of the evening is fantastic. Yeah, the, 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 it's 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 cl the spirit of those two houses is so clear in the liquid and it, it's cool to see. Like, I love that you can kind of be like, oh, this is clearly Catoctin Creek because like it just has that level of fun and excitement and interest. and brazenness that is kind of cool as can be and and um yeah no i celebrate those guys as much as i can just just fantastic work thank you becky and scott all right one I, more I had fun to, question i had I to shill for one of my favorite distilleries real quick hey that's fine we we do lots of shilling of the stuff that we like here and i'm totally here for it uh one last fun question uh actually i promised a question that i haven't asked yet um, and it's, uh, it's not quite apropos of the way this conversation has gone. Uh, but Joe, you do do a lot of stuff at Clear Creek that are various kinds of brandies and, and, uh, eau de vies, which is, uh, unaged brandy, um, for lack of a better definition for, for people who don't know. Um, the question that I have promised to ask you is, do you consider yourself these days to be more of a whiskey producer or more of an eau de vie brandy producer? Uh, <laughs> um, I think when I first started, I would have said brandy producer, and then it was whiskey for sure. Um, there was a substantial time where I made gin at a place called Green Hook Gin Smith. There's a period of my career where I wasn't at Clear Creek, and I was in New York, and Green Hook Gin Smith made incredible gin. Um, but when I came back to Clear Creek, it was whiskey. Like whiskey was my drive. Steve McCarthy's uh, legacy was my drive. Now, I think I have kind of the sweetest position. And, and it's in part because I'm doing a lot of new product development for Hood Road Distillers where I'm really embracing the hired gun aspect of my career, where I'm trying to take on new challenges that I may have looked down upon before. Um, no reason to talk about them now, but there's really kind of something fun when you're like, yeah, I'll work on this really well regard tomorrow and um, with with Ted Bro and Dale DeGroff. And yeah, I'll make another I'll make a hazelnut O to V with with Clear Creek. And these are all projects that either we've just recently released or are going to. Or, yeah, I'll make a flavored whiskey for HRD because they like want to try to take down Crown like. 
I like this. I like the idea that I that I'm trying to challenge this too often in a career you 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 pick up wherever you start you feel like it determines your entire life and you have sometimes you look down on the things um to your right and are challenged and frightened by the things to your left but i've kind of reached a point in my career where i'm just like yeah whatever it is like i want to try to do it the best i can and um that's really fun like i don't know i think i i think in the near future and in the next 10 years i'll probably go down to one specific thing that i just focus on forever as the master of that that would be where my natural course heading would be but i am i am currently in a moment where i am widespread and diverse and uh, experimenting as fast and as hard as i can on all the things that i love and all the things that i was wrong to turn my nose up at and um yeah, it's kind of a cool spot to be. I, I don't have any complaints. So, uh, you know, the way I see it is every once in a while, I, we're on Whiskey Lodge or A-Fish, and, and, the, and I kind of force the conversation of, like, what's the cheapest, most low-shelf thing that you truly love? And sometimes it's, like, this really insane root beer schnapps that is, like, 40% sugar. And there is really good gems in that sort of thing. So um, I guess it's my own personal battle to make sure I, I, I don't become pretentious and just focus on fancy whiskey and eau de vie. Uh, I want to try to learn every nook and cranny of this industry, and that involves the, the volume sellers too. And I'm really in this moment where like, yeah, we're developing a new incredibly organic farm to table uh, hazelnut and I love working on HRD on making Timberline vodka like a cooler thing using eau de vie as the flavoring agent in a raspberry expression. Um, oh that my. sounded a little pitchy. It wasn't really what I meant to do, but like I, I just want to try to push all boundaries as far as I can to provide a better product within category, no matter what it is. And 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 that involves that also means like the stuff that's on the that's like immediately when you walk into the door at the liquor store, like that that stuff has to be considered too, because why would you cheat yourself of that level of fun? That was that was a thorough answer. So thorough that I've forgotten what question I asked, but I am very happy. That you, I you, sure either. <laughs> you, you asked me, you asked me like whether I was a, more of a brandy distiller or a uh, whiskey distiller now. And I said, I'm more of a hired gun. And I like the idea that there's a, a specific, because I've been both of those things. And I like the idea that I'm just trying to challenge any, I'm trying to take on any challenge that comes my way at this point. That's great. Okay, uh, one more fun question that I had pre-prepared. Um, if you could only drink two whiskeys for the rest of your life, one is your own product, mm -hmm. and one uh -huh. is somebody else's product, what would they be? <sighs> oh, geez. Um, two whiskeys, right? Two whiskeys. You know... You have right. such a broad-based interest. I'm going to go ahead and say two spirits products in general. You've made this so much harder for the man, Denny. Okay, well, if it helps, I'll, well, I'll well, keep it constrained yeah. to whiskey. <laughs> I can see how I can see how. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, 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 and, and it's just spirits. Okay, so one is definitely going to be McCarthy's. I'd probably choose the PX Expression or the Oloroso. One of those finishes, I think, add a lot of depth to it. I'd probably stick with the PX. It's one of the ones that Caitlin and I designed. It kind of hits my natural palette best. It's good for cold weather. There's something beautiful about it. But I'd also want something that was kind of, like, lighter. And while I don't want to know what it is now, I would probably, if, for, if gun to my head forced, ask for a little time to consider what the most like I, I would look for a slivovitz honestly i look for something that was super home grown homegrown and moonshiny and slavic as hell something that was made by a grandma or a grandpa that's like in their backyard and i would find that that's what i would 
choose as my second. And I love Slivets and I make Slivets, but I would be deeply, I like my Slivets because it's an expression of me to somebody else. If I had to choose one, I would never choose my own. I want to find the one that I can speak to the most, but is a message to me. And and so it, it would definitely be some sort of weird, like you can only get it in a half melted milk jug in Poland Slivovitz. Like that's the one thing that I would choose as my second. Also, it does really good with citrus. And so you can make a hell of a daiquiri no matter what. Nice. That's, that's a great and uh, I think for the audience unexpected answer. But I am not the least bit surprised that Slivovitz was your second choice. Uh, <laughs> Love me, from, Slivovitz. That's that is, what I know about you. It is some good stuff. And Clear Creek Slivovitz what, is also what really this good. teaches me is that I need to find some better Slivovitz. <laughs> Apparently. Yeah, no, please do. Uh, there is great I'll, I'll out see. There, I don't want to try to uh, to find or pronounce or name anything off the top of my head. But I will keep in mind... Uh, that I might have a little side, uh, a little side trip finding some good Slivovitz that I could recommend, uh, and I will, I will see uh, if I can I'm, put some links to that in the YouTube description later. I'm gonna drop two places right now. Um, for American, uh, check out Elderbrand out of out of St. Louis, Missouri. Very, very small, very traditional, really cool folks crazy good eau de vies. uh also ryan hall out of the chicago area like do not undervalue the amount of 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 cool stuff they do um and i'm gonna be getting one in the mail pretty soon uh that i i can't wait to talk about it is a young man that i kind of gave a lot of advice to early on uh, as as everyone knows in the industry, like I'm only a phone call away and I want people to make good stuff and not have to worry about the growing pains. So I tend to put myself out there a lot. And as a result, I get sent cool barrels. Uh, I'm sorry, cool bottles of things that aren't available in my area. Totally legally, of course. I just don't ask how they get to me. Um, and then I, I, I will say that th that category of O to V is growing all the time. Well, awesome. Uh, that is, uh, that's the end of my questions and, uh, we've been talking for a good long time. Uh, so, uh, just in case there's any more questions, I'll just open up the floor. Uh, but I think we're pretty close to a cheers and an exit here. As a final question. Okay. That's gotta yeah, be, I'll, a, I'll just a really good po' boy shop for you to be, for you to be wearing a shirt of it. Uh, <laughs> recommendations, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I deliberately wore this. If you can get out to Dom Lisa's Po' Boy in New Orleans, you're going to have the best time of your life. Um, really pretty incredible Po' Boys. Uh, I mean, it's also just a killer shirt. Um, yeah, just the best. Uh, if you can do it, get the half and half, get it a full sandwich, get all the, all the, like, fully dressed. You're not going to, you're not going to be disappointed. And as a matter of fact, they do make probably my favorite Bloody Mary as well. Ooh, boy. I've put that in the chat just so that I don't forget. I mean, I guess I could listen back, <laughs> but I will put that in the, in the YouTube comment and the YouTube uh, notes as well. Uh, thank you for not skipping that question, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, I'm going to say right now, that's, it's the most important question. Like these sandwiches are that good. Damn. Well, all right, gentlemen, it has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you all this evening. Well, uh, yes. Are we ready to cheers and go out? Uh, does everyone have a whiskey? We're ready to cheers. Yeah. Uh, yes, I do. Or need a moment to get something. <laughs> All right. Uh, cheers to innovation. Multiples. Cheers, cheers to innovation. innovation. Slancha. Slancha.